should get cracking. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, and the first thing to do is to review and approve the agenda. Do we have any changes from what's on here? I oh. The only thing that I would say, there are, are a couple of things that I would like to potentially refer to a committee. I think that we had planned to talk about the committee last time, but I, I don't know. I, I'd just like to throw that out there, that there are a couple things I'd like to refer to a committee that we haven't yet talked about. That's fair. I think we should just talk about it as it comes up. I think the reason we held off on appointing committees was to wait till we had a full council. At well, the next meeting, next meeting. Yeah, it's not a committee appointment. It's cr the creation of a new committee. Gotcha. So does any of this have to be pulled out? No, no we can so. create new committees. No, no, I'm just saying as far as the agenda. The agenda. No, I don't think so. Okay, uh, general business and appearances. Uh, time for anybody uh, from the public to come speak on a topic that's not on our agenda. Okay, going to keep going then. Uh, so, consideration of the consent agenda. Um, I am going to pull items E and F. I'm going to pull E because I'm going to not vote on it. <laughs> I, um, if you have any questions about it, I'm happy to talk about E, but um, I'm going to recuse myself from that one because uh, it just, in, in case uh, people are uh, don't know, I'm going to be doing some professional development. Actually, we can talk about it later. Um, and then F, I, I want to talk a little bit more about. Um, any other thoughts? Right, is there a motion? I'll move to uh, approve the consent agenda uh, with the removal of E and F. I'll second it. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Mayor? Yes. Before you leave that, though, I would like to pass a comment on to Tom, if you would come up. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Should I have asked this before we voted on the consent agenda? Okay. Because oh, I wasn't good at it. But the, the bids came in with a widespread. Now, you pre qualified everybody, I assumed. Uh, yeah, the sewer okay. The sewer lining, I believe? Yes. It was one that was, who got the bid, we gave it to the lowest bidder. And I was just a little queasy how different it was. I haven't been able to get it up yet, but that was one that was like 120,000. I can what, talk. Is it okay if we talk about this? Sure. Yeah. Um, there are different strategies, different uh, technologies involved in lining, the lining process. So. The, the uh, low bidder in situ form has been around for, for many, many years, a lot of, a lot of experience. So, um, I don't know all the details. I don't know that Zach conducted a post-bid um, review, but um, I think just their general experience and knowledge of it. We, we do have, um, for example, our, our own TV um, system video, internal pipes, uh, video cameras, while others will use of their own systems. Um, so it's, it's a lot of it has to do with the technique and the technology that they're utilizing. If there were, was a way to express that within the material we got, it would be really helpful to, to some rationale. When there's such a big spread, I was just, right. I thought there was something, but I just, maybe it was there and I didn't understand it. But um, So sometimes we do what's called a bid analysis um, to determine if there are any disparities or irregularities in a bid that might explain some of the differences in cost. Um, so I think this this was not done that I'm aware of uh, for this particular bid, but, but we can provide that if you'd like a, an explanation of why the difference is. I, I think it's primarily the, uh, the methodology used by the, by the various contractors. They all met specification. They are trenchless. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, formed, aligning, 
some have some amount of excavation uh, involved, others is entirely through existing access points. So. But we can provide that detailed explanation. But for just even just a nod towards it would have helped me out because that's sure. all I need to know. Yeah, it was a it. different approach. It was rational. <coughs> you could rationalize why it was there. Fine, fine. Makes that's sense. all I need. Just a little bit. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I feel like we might as well take up E. Um, any questions about E? No, I think it's great. Can I go too? Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll let someone else. So I would move that we. Uh, I guess I don't really, not really item sure. E. Huh? <laughs> approve item approve E. Approve that we approve item E on the consent, uh, that we remove from the consent agenda. Well, it's already been removed. No, no, I said I, I said I, I, I move that we approve item E as it appeared on the consent agenda. I'll second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 I guess I, if I'm really recusing myself, I should have left. You can, you're not voting. I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> moving on. Uh, so F, the if we can take that up right now, I think it would be good to just get all of those items done. Um, so F is the um, investment policy addendum that is for the Montpelier Foundation. And um, thank you, Todd, for uh, coming on up. So uh, just a little bit of background. Um, this is a part of an um, ongoing dialogue that, I, that I've been having um, with uh, the investment committee when we started to um, – have a, a group that was managing investments for it. I, I raised the, the issue of um, uh, what I would have called uh, socially responsible investing, but um, that sort of leads to the question of like, well, who's, who's, who's ethics or who's morals? And so, um, you know, I, I think it's equally as well to frame it as um, uh, looking at environmental, social, and governance factors. And my understanding, anyway, is that uh, we don't have that there's no ESG uh, provision in this document so I, I um, had some concerns about that I, I would like to see us uh, revise our senior center investment fund to have uh, some policy guidelines about um, in environmental social and, and governance uh, risk and uh, and to be clear uh, having my understanding, anyway, of having a, an ESG policy helps reduce the amount of risk uh, to a portfolio as well as helping uncover uh, value. So uh, it is, in, as far as I, I can see, in our fiduciary interest to have some kind of a, an, an ESG uh, policy. So, uh, but I, I know you, you had just sent me something. What, yeah, so what are your I, thoughts? So there was an ESG uh, statement that was adopted back in December of 2015 by City Council. Um, if that is a provision that council finds extremely important, um, that I think we need to gather as a group and, and vet that out. Uh, there's a little bit of a conflict between the fiduciary responsibility to maximize investment performance for the underlying funds and an environmental and social responsibility as well. So uh, that is a discussion that I think we should have, you know, at the investment committee level with our investment advisor um, and see what options might be available. If, if that's something the council's inclined to pursue. I suppose I have a couple of questions, uh, and I'm, I agree with Mayor Watson that this is, some, this is a priority for me. Uh, certainly understanding that we have a fiduciary obligation to these funds, but also to the city, uh, and I think, though, part of that means creating a sustainable Montpelier that can survive all of us. Um, and so I, I appreciate that there are challenges with this, but I know that there are ways that we can transition, like responsibly transition, not sort of all or nothing all of a sudden. Um, and so I guess my question, if, if we send this to a committee and there's a, you know, I mean, I guess I feel really strongly that we as a council should make a statement about this and then send that to the committee to sort the language out. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that we pay someone to work with us on these from, uh, I think it's is it green. Maple, Maple Leaf Management. Yep. Um, but I think that direction needs to come from council, that that's something that we're committed to and, and to do so in a responsible way. And uh, I think that would give the committee a little bit more direction than just sure. saying we want to talk about this. So to back up a little bit, we do, um, we, we have significant, we're not significant, we have a fair amount of assets uh, invested currently in Maple Capital for the senior center and the parks. Um, 
this particular policy was adopted by the board of the board for the Bond Player Foundation as what was going to guide them. However, City Council does have overriding authority over that umbrella. So, uh, when Ann and I had communicated a little earlier today, the, the thought process was to move adopt the policy as presented on the con uh, consent agenda, move the funding into the um, investment fold with Maple Capital, and then develop an ESG policy that w would work as an umbrella against all the funds, and uh, is if there, that makes any sense. Is there like some overarching, I mean, is there some reason that we can't come up with the ESG language first before we approve no. this document? No, there's not. It, it just, um, I think, personal commitments. Like we, the Montpelier Foundation has been working on this policy for quite a while, and they kind of wanted to see us making progress, and that's, but that's it. I, I can talk to Ed Flan again, and uh, we can kind of work through that and get uh, to where we need to get, it, get get to where we need to go. The um, the investments currently are held um, both at Northfield Savings Bank, mm -hmm. you know, just a checking account that's not making very much money, and then uh, the balance are in a, an investment account with Touchstone Investments, which was formerly Sentinel Funds. So uh, part of the desire was to get that money producing more income. So if that that would be the only I, sense of urgency. Conflicting. One is just to join them all together, and then the question. Will Mm -hmm. they're not at odds with each other. I guess, I guess what I'm saying, though, is rather than sort of setting this out longer, I mean, if, if the council in 2015 took it up, which I, I didn't know, um, I mean, why why are we just, it sounds like we would just be kicking the can, like, up, so to approve this now and then, and then address it at some later point in time. No, I think the, the issue came up in the last 24 hours, and just to get the interested parties together, there's just you know, it's right. just coordination of that. No, right, and I'm so I'm sim I'm saying I'm I think I would feel more comfortable having that ESG language, putting that in, and then approving this doc. And I, I have no idea how anybody else feels about that, but all right. Does anyone want to move this as it is for now? Yeah, Donna. No, I support waiting. Uh, that's great. That's fine. Maybe it'll tie in before our retreat or with our retreat that it's part of our goals and sure. lay it out more clearly for ourselves and then go to the committee and work with them. Okay, so um, I think we're going to uh, let that sit for now and um, uh, I, yeah, let's uh, use that as a motivation to, to uh, get on uh, some kind of policy statement or can or we be looking at this uh, this ESG policy and see how it yeah talking more about how it applies. Be great. Yeah. Can you send that 2015 whatever was yep. voted on then? Yep. Perfect. That would okay. Great. Thank you. <coughs> change seats here. What's that? <laughs> yeah, so we're tabling on it. We're not tabling. What are we doing? Well, I mean, if we get the. Yeah, I guess we don't know. So. I think if we set it, though, for the April 11th agenda just to check in about it. To make sure it doesn't sort of fall. If we think we can, you know, get the investment committee together by then, that would be great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and I do want to communicate, you know, to the Montpelier Foundation uh, board that I'm very grateful for all of their work, and um, you know, I'm psyched that they're that, that we're moving in this direction uh, to combine funds. I think that's the right move, absolutely. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So by okay, right. So without objection. You used the postpone word, so I had to see it. Got you. So up the game a little. I two two minor things that are tangentially related to this, not directly. One, just with regard to Montpelier Foundation, I meant to tell you the other day. Um, I did have a conversation with former council member Olson, who would like to continue as a member. So she had been the council's rep. I don't know who was. <coughs> so I just told her I would share that. Um, and secondly, just this is procedural for the rest of the night. I don't think, as I look at the agenda, it's going to make any difference. Mm -hmm. But anything, any action taken that does require four affirmative votes, even though there's only five people here. Mm -hmm. Just so we're clear. Perfect. Okay. Okay, moving on. Uh, so the audit that we had postponed from last time, or did, I don't know if we tabled it last time. We had a sick, uh, no, we had a sick yeah. auditor last yeah. time. <laughs> 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 February, actually. Hello. 
welcome. Hello. So just for introduction purposes, um, I am Todd Preventure, Finance Director for the City of Montpelier. This is Teresa Kaczynski, who's the managing partner on this engagement for Father Gill's Seagallon Valley. And beside her is Ruth Doctor, who is our senior accountant for the city. She uh, does 95.9% of the legwork, pulling all of the audit documentation together, referencing the work papers, and ultimately completing the financial statements. So I'm going to turn it over to Teresa for her portion. Sure. So. Um this is the audit of the June 30, 2017. So uh, this is, it's been a while, mm -hmm. but uh, usually we, uh, we try to uh, talk about this at the January meeting, but that didn't happen this year. And then we had some people out and then I was sick. And so here we are. Um, so I, I know there's some new board members here from since last time. So I'm not sure how familiar familiar you are with audits, but um, so what we do is we come in in um, October usually and um, test all test all the books and we primarily work with Ruth and we also interview other um, staff members and um, part of what we do because you receive uh, more than $750,000 in federal funds is to do something called a single audit as well. Um, so you should have copies, receive copies of both of those. Um, so that's kind of what we do. So Ruth actually um, prepares the whole, uh, this, the financial audit documentation. Um, what Father Gill Segalian Valley does is prepare the opinion on the audit. Um, and <clears throat> this year, again, the audit was unqualified. Um, which means everything was in accordance um, with governmental auditing standards. Um, and uh, we had no findings um, on the financial audit. On the single audit that you also have, which is a separate copy, we found no findings on any of the testing um, with the major program um, of that, of the grant that year, yeah. Um, but there's a, loose piece of paper that's um, called the governance letter and that's what um, this is a letter specifically to the governing board um, and we're required to, to give this to you so I'm just gonna again just say there's no findings on the single audit or the financial audit um, on uh, the part of the audit that um, required significant um, estimates has to do with depreciation of all the infrastructure and the equipment. Just need to let you guys know that, that management, because you, you don't really know how long anything's going to last, so that's an estimate. Um, also, another estimate is the amount of uh, doubtful accounts, meaning receivables that may not be collectible. Um, another thing that's not really on here is uh, that's an estimate is <clears throat> the pension. Um, there's a pension piece of the of the audit that comes from the um, state of Vermont and that and it, if you look at that it, it will go over that a little bit. It says there's quite a bit of an unfunded amount that's really at the state level but that shoots it out to everyone that's in the state pension plan and that was a, a, a requirement a couple years ago. Again that is an estimate changes every year so just want to let you know that. Um, on page two, we talk about um, corrected and uncorrected misstatements. Um, what that means is there's some things that aren't corrected to the penny. Um, and one of them that we found this year was just a small uh, retainage payable that was not posted on one of the projects. It wasn't big. It was. I don't remember the exact dollar amount, but it, um, I did have it. it. It was under materiality. Um, we only proposed six adjustments to the financial statements, and none of them were material adjustments. Ruth pretty much finds all the adjustments as we go, and, and um, so we didn't propose any material adjustments, which is which is great. Um, and again, we had no findings. So. That's the what well, I'm required to make sure that you guys all hear. If there was significant findings, they would be in this letter. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple of uh, numbers. 
but again this is june as of june 30 17 so there's been plenty of changes um on page 15 of the audit it talks about um the fund balances of all the different funds and it shows that the total fund balance of the general fund is about oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1.2 million dollars and they're all spread out for different reasons um, that might be a little bit clear yeah it's too small <laughs> is everybody with me on that page mm -hmm. yeah. okay um, so uh, in the general fund column it shows about the 1.2 million and how that's broken up and what things are restricted for or um, non-spendable for which leaves the unassigned um, fund balance in the general fund at about 240,000. Um, and then community development, all of that fund balance is um, either committed or restricted. And the capital projects funds shows um, restricted, committed, and the negative in the capital projects funds really has to do with timing of expenditures. It's not, it's, it's not a negative, it's availability of the revenue that comes in. So that's, you know, and then there's other governmental funds that makes up all the other little funds in, that the city has, which there's a lot of them. So, um, and then on page, 19 it shows all the fund balances of um, your proprietary funds so the water funds sewer fund parking and district heat um, and you can see down below it says total net position um, and there's unrestricted and then what's invested in all of um, the capital assets that you have um, the water fund um, has a positive unrestricted fund balance. The sewer fund has a negative. And I think that actually was, the change for that year was positive, wasn't it? Didn't it make up some of that, do you remember? Well, that position went up. <coughs> right, but I think the unrestricted went up on that. Um, the parking fund has a positive unrestricted fund balance and the district heat has a negative. Um, obviously the district heat, you know, is uh, a, l a little bit concerning because it, it is um, the, the operating loss, if you go to the next page on page 20, is, um, is significant, but that's something that you're all well aware of, I'm assuming, so. And something we will have to address, assuming with the next year's rates. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. On that. Um, but other than that, I think that the <clears throat> most of the, you know, the water and the sewer and the parking are mostly holding their own. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Um, so, I mean, I don't really have much else to talk about, but that's, you know, there's no findings. Uh, Ruth has been drafting this audit for a number of years. <laughs> I hear this might be the last time she drafted this audit, but I'm not sure. But, uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> what are we going to do with that? She's threatening know. to retire. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> her retirement is continuing no, on I'm selling her home, so we're trying to come up with all sorts of vicious <laughs> rumors <laughs> as to what's wrong with it. Has the space in her backyard. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Any questions about the issues? <clears throat> so I had all my questions answered prior to last time um, in, in, in anticipation of it being on the agenda last week, so I'm feeling, feeling good about this. And uh, thank you so much for your work on this. And yeah. it's, it's Delightful to have a, an audit with no findings. Yes, yes. it is. <laughs> yep. now I want Everybody to works hard for that. That's yeah. off to Todd, and, and mm -hmm. in particular, that um, Teresa knows that that's, that's not common with a lot of municipalities to have no findings and no um, comments. So, we really have done a good job with the last few years. And it's mostly because I've been on the other side. I used to audit the city, actually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
So yep, let's it, it's been a great role for her to fill to go <laughs> from anyway. the, <laughs> the enforcer yep. to the creator. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, okay, so is there a motion to accept the audit? I'll move to accept. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right, the flood mitigation study update. Mm -hmm. This was, as a, as a scientist, I found this very delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting reading. This is really like. <laughs> but you haven't heard that word used before. <laughs> I've been sitting in the seat for 23 years. I've never heard an agenda item called the list. <laughs> it, was a, it, was some good, it was good stuff to chew on, and, and I've been thinking a lot about um, flooding in Montpelier for a while, so I'm, I'm excited to, to talk more about this. So actually, I think they're going to take just a second to set up. Oh, do they have a presentation? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, so I'm going to move. Well, and I'm going to help them do it. Oh, so okay. you guys can take five. Take two, five, whatever, yeah. <laughs> whatever we, whatever it is we need. <laughs> I was going to give some copies for yeah, as well.
Welcome. Oh, uh, I was just going to say welcome and go ahead, but if you have something else to say. No, I was just going to tee up the item before we get started. Um, this is Jeff Tucker and Dave Conger from Du Bois and King. Uh, in about, in the, I think they're going to go through the history of this, but uh, <clears throat> after the 2007 flood scare, we uh, engaged with the, the Corps of Engineers, and that took a while to get them to approve a study. And after a period of time, um, essentially uh, getting all the details, they approved Dubois and King to sort of conduct the entire study on behalf of both the city, the state, and the Corps. And so they've completed the report, which you've received the draft report. They're going to walk through it. And then there are some next steps. And ultimately, at the end of the day, not the end of today, but at some point, we have to decide whether we're going to go forward with an actual project or, or what, based on the various options or recommendations. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dave and Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Dave Conger from Dubois and King. As, as, as Bill indicated, uh, Dubois and King is the uh, uh, designer and report uh, presenter for this uh, study for the Ice Jam study for Montpelier Flood. Can you talk in your mic a little more directly? Are uh, is that better? Are <laughs> too, too much? Sorry, I also have a little a bit of a, a cold. Uh, so we were the uh, performer for the risk mitigation study for the Montpelier Ice Ice Jam project. Um, as Bill indicated, this is uh, intended to be a, a status report of you know where that draft report is, uh, some of the alternatives we have uh, looked at, and you know, sort of the, the the next steps for the the project uh, to go go forward. Can I ask you a question real quick about that? So, um, Jeff, I know you're with Dubois and yes. King, right? And are right. you also, are you with Correct. Are with, you with, with Dubois? Both with Dubois. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, and our, our nice picture on the front here is the, uh, a picture from the 1992 uh, flood study, which a lot of this uh, uh, came came from. Uh, so I wanted to give a little background for, for those who aren't as, as familiar, and this is more uh, current background. Uh, the, you know, the city experienced a, a, a major ice uh, event, jamming event in 1992. Uh, at that time, uh, State Street, as well as a significant portion of the downtown, was uh, flooded. Uh, at that time, the city and the Army Corps uh, partnered with Dubois and King at the time uh, to push for uh, what would be called a reconnaissance level uh, survey and study, uh, which was performed, as I mentioned, by DNK. Uh, at that time, in 1996, a report was uh, completed, which essentially identified ice retention piers as the most viable uh, alternative. Uh, at that point, uh, the project partners, the city, as well as the state, uh, did, did not go forward in implementing any of the recommendations in the study. Um, and as, as Bill indicated, uh, the city experienced an another scare in, in 1997 which uh, prompted a, uh, you know, a restart. Pardon? 2007. 2007. Sorry, 19, yeah, we're going backwards in time. <laughs> 2007, uh, which re-engaged us to, to do a, a further detailed study of more specifically ice retention pier locations because uh, going back to the uh, reconnaissance level survey, that uh, incorporated other alternatives in a little more broad, uh, approach and then some things like uh, flood walls and, and others that were kind of discounted at that, that first review level. So in this study, our focus um, was, was more in toward you know, locations for ice control structures. So the purpose of the study, uh, identify and evaluate alternatives to reduce risk from breakup ice jam induced events. Um, that, that's the purpose of the, the project. Um, as I was indicating, the ice control structures, the, the primary focus in, in this study is the locations that those could be uh, accomplished. Um, and then following Army Corps uh, requirements, uh, the study evaluates the permitting required, the maintenance and operational requirements for it, hydraulics, economics, uh, structural analysis, uh, environmental and coordination of public involvement. So essentially with all those elements, um, it, it's determined to find what's the most cost effective and what's the cost benefit evaluation for any given uh, alternative. Uh, I, I want to point out the, the structural analysis that really honestly is more uh, of a study of the city of Montpelier, the uh, 
buildings in the city, their commercial value, because of course in a, a flood control structure, the everything is about the cost for the actual project and the potential damage to uh, buildings and, and infrastructure. So uh, most of that is basically melded together to come up with, you know, here's the alternative and here's the cost benefit uh, for those alternatives. Um, as I indicated before, uh, <coughs> from the reconnaissance level survey and in, into today, the, the single ice control structure with a bypass channel uh, is, is seem to be the most effective alternative to affect, uh, reduce the potential for break of ice uh, events. Uh, so our, our, again, our focus was looking at locations for that. In this latest draft, we have five potential locations for ice control structures, um, and we'll describe a little bit of those uh, now. David, can, can I jump in Absolutely. for a second? So, so for, I, I did want to mention that please, and, and obviously jump in, interrupt if you have questions, you know, as we, as we go along through. And, uh, and David is going to be describing ice con control structures, and I just wanted to mention this, this dates back to, to the 1990s when we did the reconnaissance study following the event. We worked, and, and many of these came from, we worked very closely. When we say the Army Corps of Engineers, that includes Corel, you know, the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab, really one of the preeminent ice engineering uh, experts around the world. They're out of Hanover, New Hampshire. So, so. Uh, they, they've had in the, in the background and both on this current study as well as the, the, the genesis for this. So just a, it's way back one for you. Okay. So with these uh, alternatives that are, are presented in, in this report, uh, some of these will go into various locations, but the, the primary is that any ice control structure, the, the first ice control structure that would be installed would be one with a with a bypass channel. The intention for the bypass channel is that um, essentially ice control structures, their the reason of being is to create a jam. And when you want to create a jam, uh, it's not very hard to see that eventually, you know, water's going to fill up behind that jam, uh, and thus the the standard practice, and, and this has been done by Army Corps at other locations is provide a bypass channel that can take the, the water flow while maintaining the uh, ice uh, in this location. So for the locations in Montpelier, um, you know, Cemetery Bend, you know, the 1992 event was a ice breakup that uh, filled up at Cemetery Bend, thus uh, backing up water behind it. And unfortunately, State Street was the, the bypass uh, channel. Um, so our focus is to prevent ice getting down to Cemetery Bend and then having a bypass locally where the ice control structure is to, to bypass uh, flows around the ice control structure. So again, alternative one is a single ice control structure with bypass. Alternative two um, was brought into the mix because ideal location, you put your ice control structure just immediately above your condition where it would be, in this case, be Cemetery Bend. Um, there is no real location down that portion of the river to have a bypass con uh, control structure. So we had to move our alternative one site further and further up the, the river. Um, so we have paired this in, in an alternative with a single ice control structure downstream from the bypass channel to, to catch uh, extra ice kind of thing, ex with the exception that that does not have a, a bypass uh, channel. Um, Alternative three, during the reconnaissance level survey, um, more operational uh, maintenance type uh, requirements were, or mitigations, I should say, um, were explored, and we re-explored those. Uh, right now, the city, and this is kind of one of those things that, and Bill certainly is uh, really into the details of this, of, you know, has been doing continual efforts of doing mechanical and thermal weakening, everything from, uh, you know, long stick excavator to thermal weakening with the, the sewer uh, bypass into the, to the river. So at, as part of this study, we looked at those alternatives and, and is there a means to make those uh, more enhanced, uh, you know, a, a stronger action. Um, and, and that's, again, part of the study to see if that's uh, 
just to be perfectly clear for all those that are listening, it is treated sewer out of the sewer treatment plant bypass, not, <laughs> not sewer bypass. Sorry, sorry. So Correct. Water that is already appropriately being discharged into the river with moved to a different location. That is warmer than the normal room. Warm, warm treated water. Um, and, and any, uh, all these uh, type of studies, uh, there's always the alternative, the, the no action alternative. Uh, so the, the locations of, of these alternatives, um, essentially, it's a little hard to see on, the, on this scale, but location A um, was the former Zorzi property. Uh, it was the first location upstream where there was uh, real estate essentially uh, undeveloped at that time that could accommodate a bypass channel. So our first ice control structure location, and just because the, the nature of the study and how far we are along the line before that became uh, uh, developed or in, under development for um, the gin, gin mill, is that one of the um, So that still is the, the basis because uh, some of the modeling that Corell had done and some of the other things were, were already in, in place. So it still stays in the study to as really our, our baseline for the project. Uh, that again is the, the single ice control structure for with the bypass. Location B is, is the location for our second ice control structure without uh, a bypass. That is just a that upstream of the dam by Main Street um, in the channel near, I guess that's the end of Stonecutter's Way. And then the, the three alternatives that we in the last year have looked at with the Zorzi property being uh, under development was location A2, which is literally just upstream of the Zorzi property, straddling the, uh, the railroad bridge and some properties uh, just on the upstream side of the, the railroad bridge. Uh, location C is at the former Grossman's uh, property at the, the bend in the river, and the, the furthest up uh, location is, is at the Stevens Branch mouth. So alternative one, and we've, we've discussed this a little bit, this is uh, uh, pictorial with a stream channel bypass, piers in the river, uh, overflowing water into the sides. Advantages of, of this type of structure is it's a proven technology, uh, fairly low maintenance. Once it's installed, the disadvantage is you know it has the potential for, for jam buildup in the, the non-winter times for tree debris, uh, other debris that uh, has the potential to you know jam it during non-winter events. Uh, it does have ecosystem impacts of this for for the actual installation. Um, in this study, this re or these reaches, I should say, of the river uh, have a, a threat, a state threatened uh, pearl, eastern pearl mussel. Um, that, excuse me, I'm losing my, my voice a little bit. Uh, that um, species, a study was done where basically divers went into the river, identified the number of mussels that are present. Uh, two things with that is that first, uh, it's identified that this area is a, a habitat for these, this species, and the second is to, to just get an idea of the number of the uh, mussels. The, the, the upshot, though, is the same thing that they do for the evaluation to determine if they're in place is the same thing you would do to uh, mitigate. Uh, you would have divers go into the, the river they would identify the area that any piers would be installed, and they would relocate the, the mussel to uh, a suitable other portion of the, the riverbed. So even though it is a rare species, the impact these would be fairly minimal. Um, so that would be a, a cost to, uh, um, you know, as the construction occurred, to, to relocate them out of the way. Maybe while well, David catches his voice just for a second. First of all, any, any questions yet? People like to you know, jump in? Or <coughs> I have lots of questions, but I might save them to the end. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, or, I, I mean, if, if it buys you more time, because your voice, I'm, I'm happy to ask. I don't know. If, unfortunately, I, with the, um, I'm on the back end of a cold, which is yeah. sitting in my mouth. I don't know if uh, 
time will help. Um, well, okay, so I'll, I'll just throw in uh, one question here. So as, as I was reading through this, um, you had some benefit to cost um, ratios, which I was glad to see. But um, uh, this is not something that I do for a living. So what is like a home run uh, benefit to cost ratio? Because I saw, you know, one was like two to one and I and another one was like 1.69 or and I, I was trying to gauge like how 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 good is that? I mean, it's good that it's like, you know, more than one to one. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with in the Army Corps world, uh, they won't fund anything that's certainly below one to one. Uh, and why would you? Um, and I guess this is more of my experience, and Jeff has yeah. probably more years of this. If, if you are really more than, you know, 1.2 or, or higher, mm -hmm. it's a pretty good, you know, ratio. Uh, you know, and usually, you know, that's the basis, certainly from the, the dollar standpoint. Um, and, and usually it's the municipalities of decisions of, like, you know, what are the other ancillary impacts that you know, may not be monetary that mm -hmm. then become the, the question mark. But in the, in the realm that we are in, they're, they're pretty significant. Uh, um, going, going back uh, maybe uh, a, a minute here, um, one of the proposals uh, I th if I read it correctly, suggested taking out on one of the railroad bridges. I, does that sound familiar? It. We we can come to that. Okay, maybe I'll, I, I'll yeah. hold that question. Then. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll save my questions. Okay. My my <coughs> uh, And let me know if you want me. You know, <laughs> any time. If I start squeaking too much, you can just take <laughs> over. Okay. Uh, alternative two, as I indicated before, it is actually. Uh, a twofer uh, alternative. It's, it's, it's always paired with a bypass channel. Uh, in this case, the it is that standalone piers that are downstream of our primary ice control structure with a, with a bypass. Um, the advantages of the, this, again, is the, the further we, upstream we get, the, the less ice that we're able to capture um, at the primary location. So it, it adds that extra capture requirement and when you get into the, the details of the, the study you'll actually see that the cost benefit ratio goes down for that um, however it's our, our feel and our feel from Krell that it's not being adequately modeled and that it, it really is the the preferred alternative to, to pair that ice control structure with a second uh, peer location um, but again it, it does have other uh, potential effects and and, and one which I'll, I'll highlight is, and this is a little bit of all of them, is it does have the potential for in, what's called induced flooding, in this case along Stonecutter's Way. Um, now, I would say for the moment, don't, don't let that frighten you too much because some of this is, is modeling that needs to be vetted with uh, the final design. Stonecutter's Way gradient-wise is, is fairly flat uh, between uh, Main Street and, and that upstream reach. and the amount of induced flooding is its inches. So the there is the potential that you know further study would say, yep, we don't really have induced flooding, or we have fairly easy mitigation measures to 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 compensate for that. Thank you. Just before we move on past this alternative, can I ask? Am I understanding it correctly that? Ideally, uh, these two locations would be as n close together as possible. The one is, is fixed near Main Street without a bypass. Correct. And there's a, another one somewhere upstream. Um, and so that the one near Main Street uh, gets uh, as little ice as possible from between, should they be as, as close together as possible? Um, or are any of the upstream locations more or less equally acceptable? The it, reason for the location for the, the second one, in a, in a fashion, actually, we want that as far downstream as we okay. can get it. Um, in this case, because the East Branch, we don't want to go any further than we are um, mm -hmm. without a bypass. Um, so it's a little, in an ideal world, the one with a bypass would be where we have, you know, the single, you know, just the peer locations. Um, so it's 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 to capture us be as far down the stream as we can to okay. to capture. So 
So, so, so ideally, as David just said, perhaps just to say it a little bit differently, is your primary ice retention structure, again, as Dave said at the beginning, it, it holds the ice in place for a certain amount of time. We induce a jam, and we induce it where hopefully there's not, or intended, not hopefully, where there's not going to be much damage. It's that proverbial uh, you know, rural area. So once we do back up water upstream of it, it's flooding, but there's nothing there to get damaged, right, if you will. It's not in a downtown urban area. So we want to, we want to, we ideally locate it as far downstream or as close as you can to the primary damage area, but there just really isn't any, any location for the full bypass. You know, we induce the jam upstream, the river really comes up, it has to have a place to go, as he said correctly, it was State Street back in 1992. So, you know, we felt that this area by the railroad, uh, you know, the former Zorzi area was as, was as downstream as practical, but there's still a fair amount of ice between there and, and, and downtown. So the whole objective of the secondary or downtown structure was to catch and, and retain some of that intermediate you know, volume of, of ice. But the modeling's indicated not so significant where, where we feel it would work with, with, with what we call an in-channel bypass, because there's still gonna be water flowing through these piers and underneath you know, the ice. So they're really working in tandem you know, with each other. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the purpose, and we do feel that that is I think what we refer to all to options is the data. Yes. Yeah. Alternative three. Uh, essentially, as I mentioned earlier, the these are some of the things that the city has uh, engaged on uh, to this point uh, since the the ninety two event. Uh, more <coughs> more your operational uh, systems and it, it can incorporate uh, breakage using long stick. Uh, they even actually have the Krell has, uh, I forget the name of the, the structure, but basically it's a boat that goes on the river and breaks up the ice. Uh, it's about a couple hundred thousand f of x. Oh, we had it in here. I didn't realize we had it on here. Um, smashing the the ice up to into pieces. The uh, redirection of the clean water from the sewer plant, uh, <laughs> thermal water, uh, to to do th weakening of the water. Um, as we looked at these locations um, and these operational removals, basically it wasn't scalable. Um, the if it was the, the thermal or even the mechanical, you know, there, there are things that the city still should do and really isn't very important to the, the practice, but they're not scalable to the type of ice breakup that we experienced in the 1992 uh, event. Um, as an example of that, you know, we looked at the the thermal mass that we can get from the uh, bypass from the sewer uh, uh, or outfall, um, and it doesn't have any enough thermal energy to weaken enough ice. Um, I believe the city has a, a permit where it could be extended upstream uh, to different locations to get to the locations, um, but right now there's just not the thermal energy to, to break up enough ice or weaken enough ice to, to get it to that sort of next level of uh, um, you know, flood control from an ice breakup uh, project. The other portion to this for any of the, the mechanical breaking, uh, everything's timing. Um, you know, the city has done a you know, great job of you know, learning what's happening in these reaches, what's happening you know, downstream and, and the like. And Again, uh, it's just not being able to scale that up to uh, a real large breakup event uh, type of type of study. Just a question: is, is this something you can use before the ice gets too thick to prevent it from building up? It, well, it gets into the the, the timing. Um, you know, if if the the ice can form fairly quickly, and in, in, in a breakup ice is is just that. It might be something up upstream that that breaks and releases, comes down to, in this case, grounds out by cemetery bend. Um, and, and that's, I guess, essentially what the city is, is doing now is is identifying locations where, you know, they can and where there's risk occurring, uh, in kind of in live situations with the stream. Um, it's just a, you know. The scalable of the you know the whole river corridor being able to do that in, a, in nature to, to prevent a breakup uh, it, it doesn't scale that yeah yeah my my little brain was just thinking of literally in the downtown 
area where the river is going is keeping that open so it doesn't form much ice. So that when you got the jams, there wouldn't be anything that was hitting. It would we, help it. We can't get the, I mean, not without humongous investment. We can't get the valve flow all the way up there, but we're, it comes out a little below the high school and we can get it up a little further than that, but that's probably as far up as the Bailey Island <coughs> Bridge is, is, is the extent of it. Um, but what we do it preventively now. We see conditions starting to, to mm -hmm. develop. We turn it on, and it is intended to basically weaken up a little channel so that there's free flow of water, and that sometimes does help sort of keep the ice a little weaker so that, like you said, there's not there's room for it to push through. If it, if it does jam up against it, it's not foolproof, but, you know, it's also it has been somewhat successful. And we've coupled that with having the excavator on site. So, again, we can scoop out if we have to. But, you know, I don't think any of that would be enough if, if there were a massive jam respond. Right, but this versus being alternative one, two, and three, it could be something working with oh, absolutely. another alternative. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, don't get me wrong, though, this, the, the current things that are being done should still continue. Yeah, they and are important. They, and yeah, they absolutely. Do yes. uh, I, and as we say that, the things that are being done, I, alternative four, technically, I guess we're really having no no action is not occurring because the, the right. mechanical thermal type of work is, is ongoing and, and should on, be ongoing. Um, the, the pictures, just to put things into to context, are uh, different modeling uh, and also observation of the 1992 uh, uh, inundation. And it's a little hard to see at this scale, but essentially the, the red and blue and purple that are heading up to the upper right is basically all the inundation that was up the east branch and the big blob in the middle is State Street. Um, and so as I, everyone knows, the, the 1992 event, uh, you know, essentially uh, flooded the entire uh, downtown. Um, so that that um, kind of is the, the no action uh, highlight or low light. The next piece is um, next steps. Um, for our team, uh, our, the project partners is the City of Montpelier, as well as the Army Corps. Um, we are going to be setting up a meeting with the uh, DEC as well as the city to to review our draft report uh, to kind of vet the recommendations and conclusions <coughs> that we have in in the report, um, and then turn that around to a final report back to the city for approval, um, which kind of will be the the point where. You know, it'll be, you know, I guess you're a court to make decisions on, you know, next actions. Uh, obviously, the it's a big step to to build these uh, structures. Um, it's not in necessarily the presentation, but uh, to put it in order of context, uh, it's uh, it's about 4.4 million dollars to do both ice control structures. Uh, 3.6 million if you were to do just the the single with the with the bypass. Um, so it is a significant investment um, to to get into um, and then of course depending on you know the idea to proceed uh, seeking funding doing final design uh, NEPA doing our final environmental uh, reviews and and construction uh, so that is uh, I guess the, the end of the presentation and I know you said you had Plenty of questions. Sure, yeah. Not another point to you. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, let's uh, transition here again and turn the lights back on, I suppose. I'm going to move my seat. Can we have these <coughs> slides? Because not everything in your slides is in our report that was attached to our agenda. <coughs> the no. Yes, but our, uh, th that we got attached to our agenda, not all the pictures and diagrams are, are in our report that's linked. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I want them electronic. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Yeah. <laughs> electronic. We'll get that email out. Yes. Okay. okay, well, if other people have questions, I want to give you Go an first. opportunity. Go for it. Or the public. <laughs> or we'll, we'll, maybe we'll start and then it's um, public answers. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, other questions that I that I had. Part of your report mentioned um, uh, dusting the ice cover. Uh, does that sound familiar? Yes. Okay, what are we dusting it with? 
pixie dust. Uh, oh, perfect. Okay, just, just kidding. Um, it's actually uh, a measure to darken the actual ice to improve uh, thermal conductivity to melt the ice. Um, it's a practice that, um, again, has been done in, in different locations. I don't know the last time the city has done it. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. I think we used what you I assume that, that increases turbidity some some amount, but it's it's it's, not it's minor um, because you don't need a you know huge coating for it. Um, and again, it's it is one of those measures that uh, it does help. Uh, the, the amount is is not in my in my opinion significant. To, so. um, okay. Um, on. Uh, the, the potential locations for an ice control structure, um, I, I think it was um, s maybe it's C that has the railroad bridge in it, but there was one part where you mentioned removing a railroad bridge, uh, and it's, it, it was not, like, if that's a railroad bridge that is functioning, um, unless there's some other bridge that I'm thinking of, <laughs> it yeah. seems like that would be pretty prohibitive. In under certain, the, re the reason we, did, did that alternative was it was the most, the closest to the baseline alternative that we had for the, the project, which was the Zorzi property. Uh, a little bit of that is the, the, the modeling and the report that we have to do to meet the, to match the Corps of Engineers. Now, the, I will also say on that particular location, one, from a location standpoint, it still is our, our best location model-wise. Now, Cost-wise, impact-wise, it certainly you could do something there where a railroad bridge was replaced or other you know things brought in. Uh, it also has the disadvantage of uh, requiring uh, significant purchases of some properties at that location that uh, are are currently developed. Um, but we had to bring that into the study more to to show what's the next semi-viable location upstream from the, mm -hmm. the, the former Zorzi property. Okay. Um, so there was one line in this that I was very interested in, um, which was that any structure in the river has the potential to cause flooding where it would not have occurred otherwise, um, which I assume is, I mean, r mostly referring to these, uh, these structures, the right? Pairs. And that really, I mean, in part, they're meant to induce flooding elsewhere. Um, but I wonder if that applies to other things. And I guess one of the things that was, uh, at least to my reading, sort of notably absent was uh, uh, any assessment on the, the bridges, uh, not the bridges, I'm sorry, the dams that exist in the river uh, already. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, I guess I, I would have guessed that, you know, a, a study such as this would have uh, potentially included, like, you know, do, would you recommend taking, I mean, there's, there, uh, taking out the, the dam at uh, Main Street or the one up at Pioneer Street. Um, and then there's even like a little rat dam on the, yeah. on the, uh, the North Branch. Um, and maybe what that was not your understanding of like the scope of what y'all were working on, but um, that line anyway, any structure in the river has the potential to cause flooding where it would otherwise not have occurred. Uh, tells me that, you know, in my in my opinion, when I think about, you know, is it worth removing dams in the river, that tells me that it might be. Is that a fair uh, assessment? It, I guess as the as the potential, yes. Um, our, you, you're correct. Our study did not look at, you know, the effect of removal of the of the dams in this location. Um, alternatively, we actually looked at, and I think it was more in the the reconnaissance uh, study in '96 of of utilizing the dams as locations for uh, these these structures. Um, I'll preface, and, and, and Jeff could probably, because he was more involved in the 96 study than I, uh, that the effect of going the route of upgrading these dams to have them having something more significant on top really would require significantly more construction impact than doing just standalone ice control piers. Mm -hmm. um, the removal of the dams, uh, one, it was not studied, um, but that's the condition that has been there since 92. That is the condition that the, the 
stream and, and the, the events have occurred. So to some degree, there is the potential that those dams are assisting in, in ice retention uh, up, upstream and, and the like. Um, I think the only, the, the, the baffles on the, the Main Street Dam were taken out. That was, was that before the 92 event? Go. Yes, the, the close pin dam at the close Main Street yeah. that was dropped back in the 70s. The 70s. 1980s, maybe. I don't remember exactly. Okay, so that, that was yeah. before the 92 yeah. event. But yeah, we really looked at the Pioneer Street Bridge uh, for several, uh, the dam just upstream of the Pioneer Street Bridge, excuse me, that, you know, that one there. And, and David's correct, I mean, in, in, in some ways, in, Depending on the year, obviously, and, and the ice up, freeze up conditions, it actually, theoretically, anyway, can't help. It doesn't hurt. Um, there's, from from a pure engineering, I think, point of view, there's a, there's a fair amount of benefit of, of reconstructing that into a more robust. Um, I don't want to say we dismissed it, but but the. the I think that just the, the, the reality of being able to, to use that and, and basically make it even more of a, of a, of a barrier, you know, for, for aquatic organisms and fish and stuff like that. It's probably just not real, really realistic at all versus the piers. Um, and, and, and David can give a description if people aren't quite visualizing what they mean. It's almost like a bridge abutment so water can freely flow around and it's not a barrier. So really doing a major major reconstruction of the dam stuff stream of pioneer for the purposes of ice it's probably really not practical we just didn't look at it mm -hmm. much more because of that we just didn't feel it would get any traction at all in the, in the regulatory realm well it's interesting because i mean one of those the main locations is uh, it sounds like it's on top of the main street dam mm -hmm. is that it, it's just upstream it's, it's just upstream, just upstream. Of it. yeah correct uh, that's that's when I, I feel like I have to chew on. <laughs> but it's not a full river blockage, Barrier. though. You know, water still during normal right. flow, even flood flow, still flows through the piers. Sure. Um, okay. Well, I think those are all the questions I have for now. Um, any any other folks on the council? Yeah, Donna. So, uh, when you go to DC, the under VNA for your report, will you be talking about your recommendation? Correct. Yeah. So that's, they're, what, they're one that's of the, what you'll be leading with. So do we get input to that recommendation or do we just accept the report and say move So forward? I think that the idea now was to, so, so first, you don't, you're not making a commitment tonight. Yeah, this is a draft. This is the chief council's chance to comment on the draft and provide whatever input they want. As I understand right. it, and then we are going to meet with the other partners to make sure they've agreed with the conclusions and the methodologies and that kind of thing. They'll, you know, they'll probably have their science staff on it more than an elected group, but we are, are the client, so that includes the state and, and the feds. And then um, after everyone's come back, then there'll be a sort of a final report that we'll present it, and we can accept it or not, and then make a decision about what we want. And, and assuming they do, so and, you know, I mean, they are funding partners as well as there's funding partners on the study. But then, presumably, if we were to go ahead with a project um, or not, but if we are, then we would they would be be funders to that as well. So um, the state and the Army Corps would have to be willing to go along with us. I don't, I doubt the city would want to shoulder all of that on its own. Yeah. Oh, Ashley, yes sort of piggybacking on uh, what Ann mentioned, I think it would be really important for, for everyone to be able to see sort of what the, the potential looks like for flooding given each option. I realize there are so many variables there, but, you know, people's properties are impacted and, and regardless of whether it's rural or, you know, in the sort of urban core, I mean, I think, I think that's something that that we would need to know, at least I personally would like to know before making a decision about sort of how to proceed here. Certainly understanding that it would be a rough estimation, you know, here are the possible areas that would be impacted by this. And I think residents should, should have access to that information too, given <coughs> that I'd like to have a public hearing to sort of get input about this. Um, and, you know, given the, the changes to the zoning, I think that, that this could also sort of 
raised some other issues depending on how we chose to proceed that we should be fully aware of or at least as aware as we could possibly be before making uh, at least before I'd be comfortable making a decision and maybe that's not possible but it sounds like it might be possible to at least identify certain areas that would likely be impacted depending on which choice we made right and, and, and I think that's they're all very excellent points what, what, what our intention was is just kind of a, a very brief if you will half an hour brief overview and you know we've, we've generated and are generating some significant amount of engineering and scientific that really looks at existing conditions and, and very much counsel to your point uh, you know flood levels under various conditions under existing and then under each alternative what is the increase or the induced flooding and where is it and so so a lot of that technical information you know it has been generated I and mean, we've got a you know, appendices and stuff that really is quite thick if you were to print it all out. And so one of the things we would ask you folks to be thinking about is, you know, is what to do with that as we ramp up to meet with the other project partners to talk about, you know, the more minutia of this. And yes, the recommendations coming out of that, one of the things, the input we'd like to get from your, from the city manager would be through, from you folks is, you know, is there, a, you know, a, Public informational presentation, or, or, or maybe some workshops, or something like that. Uh, there, there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Such a, we we expect to come out, you know, with a, with a draft report. You know, once we've met, you know, with you know, sit down with State of Vermont folks over at Agency of Natural Resources and stuff. And we want to be able to come back to the city, you know, with a draft. You know, that's got you know all this information in it. And then look, I think, for some direction of well, how do we present that? You know, what, is, what is the form? We certainly don't expect that, boom, here you go, and please make a decision tonight. That's obviously not, not acceptable to you guys. So. I think it's important to understand. We'd, we'd like to wrap up this project. It's been going for a long time, but, yep. but it's also been going for a long time, and so we want to take the time to make sure we do it right. There's not, it's not like someone's waiting for it you know, to be approved by next week after seven years of work. So. This was, it was at a place where it was ready to be presented to you all to start thinking about it and get aware that over this year we'll be looking at this issue. Well, I guess to that, to that point, I mean, it has been a long time. And, uh, you know, when I, when I think about, you know, flooding the river, I do think about the, the contribution of the dams um, to that flooding or the potential that they, they um, have. And so I don't know, if not this study, then who would make that evaluation? And so I'm sure it's probably late in the process for, to, to suggest you know, to you all that like that would be a, a valuable piece, uh, at least for me, I don't wanna speak for everybody else, but uh, in terms of assessing whether or not uh, removal of dams would benefit uh, you know, the, the ice situation. Um, or even, I mean, I, I, again, I recognize this was about uh, ice jams. I also wonder about like just the fluvial <laughs> flooding right. um, that uh, that might contribute to. And uh, I think it's worth uh, recognizing, you know, in the um, you know in the the, the benefit uh, analysis here too, just the the recreation um, sort of aspect of that as well. Um, so. That the, the the dams do present a, a barrier to, <laughs> literally, um, to recreating. So, I uh, just want to make sure that that is is a, a part of the the assessment. Um, so I'm I see you all taking notes. I, I wonder <laughs> if that means that uh, you are that that is a, a possibility, uh, or or not, or not so much. What's your thought on that? I mean, I guess on the the removal of the dams. Um I think we will we bring forward some of the information that we had done in the reconnaissance level survey and put it in, into this study, um, which you know sort of dusted it off, you know, put it in here based on the, the, the current thinking. Um, I, I believe the answer essentially will be as as we kind of indicated that um, theoretically they're actually helping, um, but to identify that the fact that to remove them it has a a larger ecosystem in impact versus the the dams itself. Um, beyond the the fluvial side of this for removal of the dams, that would be probably beyond our our, our study sure. to be able to look at that. Um, which does get into as, as you said the um, and, and you're you're very correct in identifying that the 
ice control structures. Um, if, if other councilors aren't aware of this, the, they do nothing for a fluvial uh, event. Uh, really, this is just for the ice breakup type event. Um, fluvial events is really governed by the channels uh, of the stream uh, and the, the flood area. So, so, so again, this does, no, does no, nothing for those potential events. Uh, but again, the study is also looking at the ice events that historically have occurred to come up with a cost benefit based on ice events, not fluvial events. So it, it is, you know, just comparing that type of uh, flooding event. Um, okay, thank you. And then again, the last item on the, the recreational aspect, uh, absolutely can incorporate uh, a, a, a discussion about that. Sure. Uh, Donna. Y you know, you have this wonderful graph showing your locations, a, a through D. Is there a way to interface each of these locations with the map like earlier you showed in 1992 where the water went? So if we put it here, where would the water go? If we put it here, where would the water go? Could you turn that into a, a, a map kind of visual? I think that might be similar to what your, yes. your comment is. Yes. The, the, the map that we had uh, up there, which had the, the three different colored one, was, was an inundate, we call it an inundation map. Uh, in that case, for the 99, 1992 was our, right. our base model year. Um, we certainly can do that for, you know, that base year for uh, one ice control structure inundation, two ice control and ice, excuse me, ice control structure in, inundation to see the, the, the delta between the 1992 event and if that would occur um, with our structures in, in place. Uh, the one thing I would uh, caution, I think this, it will be very good for if the, we go forward with some kind of public presentation, is that um, you back that away. Everything that we do is is based on probabilistic uh, yes. evaluation. Yes. So yes. that's a, a snapshot of a particular flood event, and right. everything that we, we do is based on different events over a course of a, you know a 200-year type of uh, look at things. So it's good graphics to get a you know sort of the gut check of you know how is this going to impact things uh, or improve things, um, but it doesn't necessarily get all the statistics, you know, that, that we get into when, we, when we're doing the cost-benefit evaluation. Um, but it, it definitely is a graphic that, that gives you a good sense of, you know, what, what happens when you put these in, uh, and, and we can certainly provide that. Yeah. Um, Ashley. Um, and the only other thing, uh, and I can't remember if it was in the 2010 piece, I think, when the city sort of revisited this the last time and, and now we're here. I, I think I read somewhere that the city spends approximately $450,000 annually on flood cleanup. Is that, am I right? I remember reading that somewhere. I don't know where I, I read that. I remember reading that as well, and, and that, like, if we do nothing, the annual damage to downtown. I'm not sure that that was money that the city spent. I think it was averaged out. If okay. we have a catastrophic flood, Event. then okay. we should expect yeah. that. I think that that, because I, I remember that number too, and I think that what it means is if we have a catastrophic catastrophic flood and we spend many millions of dollars <laughs> once every X years, then that means $450,000 yeah. per year. I found it, yeah, future damages without the project are expected to average $431,275. Um, so, I guess one of the things that would be really helpful to me, you know, sort of thinking about dollars and cents of this whole thing, I know that, you know, you're still sort of putting together what these, what these estimates would actually look like and all of that, but it would be really helpful to sort of get an idea for sort of what those funds are, like what those funds actually are and sort of how they're used and what part of that is uh, to help local businesses sort of get back on their feet versus how much of it is at, at directed at city focused cleanup and, and sort of those kinds of things because I mean right there is a there is I'm not saying you know that this is the answer but there is a world in which sometimes a project is cost prohibitive you know when you sort of look at what you would expend versus how much it's going to cost you the project I'm not saying that that's sort of where we're at here but it would be really helpful to know what those numbers actually mean like the I, I assume those are the do nothing numbers right. um and sort of how that breaks down versus like what the, the sort of long-term cost savings would look like, as, obviously assuming we have a major flood event every year. But, um, and uh, I had one other, um, oh, the other thing, I would encourage, 
you to sort of talk to downtown local business owners. I don't know if that would be through Montpelier Live or, or whether that would go through Bill. Um, but I think that it would be really um, valuable to sort of get their insight on all of this because a lot of them have been affected. Even this year, there have been a couple of floods that, that have had a pretty big impact for some folks. So um, I think that would be a really important perspective to hear sort of about what the options look like. And obviously, if we're going to have to fund this, if we do decide to go forward, that you know means a bigger conversation with lots of people. So, And I do believe some of the, those damage mm -hmm. estimates are based on those, those histories with them businesses and, and one of the one of the I don't mean to speak for I, your study but I just I remember that that one of the that. things that we do is actually inventory every every property that was in a potential area what what was in it what was potentially the, what its risk factor was and that kind of thing. But that would be yeah. very helpful to see that well see the I'll, I'll give you a little nerdy inf information um, the, the, num the number is specifically damaged to buildings and infrastructure so it's just buildings just and building infrastructure. structure so the the way that's done is is through the army corps they have what they call depth damage curves uh, a certain amount of damage value to a property with a value property off of the census i'm not sorry not the census, but the uh, assessment of uh, any building is based on the location it is the depth of the water that actually is occurring to it and then that gets calculated to a an assigned damage for that type of uh, residential building, commercial building, and, and it really is calculating that and then basically annualizing it to the 431 uh, number. So again, it's not something that's going to happen every year, but it's annualized over a time period to, to see what that damage would be if, if nothing is, is done, uh, yep. based, again, based on uh, city assessments and maybe maybe this is something that the city should do or Montpelier Live or the business association something but there's obviously also a cost to business owners when this happens um, you know and obviously if the option that we choose is to do nothing I think we need to be informed about what that would mean for businesses that are likely to be affected because we have an obligation to them too yeah I'd say businesses have been very engaged and certainly even when we have uh, flood risk you know when we notice ice jamming or rising um, we typically meet with them and try to communicate with what's going on and they're very aware that the gauges are public and I know many business owners in vulnerable places monitor our gauges very regularly and use that as their own for their own preventive measures but even then this winter we had one that popped up in the middle of the night and we had some downtown flooding that in basements that you know came really fast because it was a, a jam that came and left so I, I want to yeah. start Moving on, and so it comes from the public. So if you would uh, state your name and your address, and or like what street you're on, and just, uh, we don't have a timer today, so keep it brief. <laughs> oh, yeah, I suppose I could. Can everyone hear me? All right, and I am a Montpelier resident of Liberty Street, but I'm wanting to submit a statement on behalf of the Vermont River Conservancy, where I serve as the Development and Outreach Director. Vermont River Conservancy is a nonprofit land trust working statewide to protect land along our waterways for public access, ecological health of our rivers, and to work towards more flood adaptive communities. The Vermont River Conservancy has reviewed the study, and the point we would like to respond to publicly is 5.2, the flood mitigation alternatives. VRC believes there is another option, an alternative approach to flood mitigation called let a river be a river. I know this may sound like option number four listed in this study, which is no action, but our alternative is rather the opposite. It in fact is several different actions coming at the problem from several different angles. We as a state have learned a great deal since Tropical Storm Irene about the power of rivers. VRC has worked closely with state agencies, municipalities, watershed-focused organizations, as well as FEMA. And we have learned collectively that we simply cannot control our rivers. The more we build around rivers, the more we install infrastructure that can age, the more we try to manipulate rivers, the more vulnerable to flood events we become. 
Rivers are becoming even more dynamic and powerful with climate change, and the accompanying extreme weather events are hard to predict. But what we can be sure of is more flooding more frequently. For years in urban areas throughout the country, we have industrialized, channelized, walled our rivers with concrete, and essentially turned our backs to our rivers. Montpelier is no different. As the main stem of the Winooski meets the North Branch in the center of town, they are surrounded by parking lots, roads, concrete walls, and gas stations right at the river's edge. There are far more gas stations along the river in Montpelier than there are places to access and enjoy our rivers. Fluvial geomorphology is not going to change. The facts of river dynamics are not going to change. General laws of hydrology and physics are not going to change. We need to change. It is time for Montpelier to turn around and face the river. How can we change? We can't lift up our structures and simply rearrange them on a whim. What we can change is how we relate to the river. The alternative that VRC would like to offer is a holistic approach, taking into consideration our place in the watershed system. Examples of techniques within this approach are learn from the past. The report notes that the 1992 flood event damage in Montpelier was an estimated $5 million. As uh, Councillor Hill mentioned, what did that number consist of? Are there behaviors we can change to avoid some of these damages? Upstream, downstream collaboration. When there was a threat to release some water from the reservoir in Marshfield during the flood event in May 2011, the connection between upstream and downstream communities was starkly evident. What if communities worked together to plan for flood events and consider, considered ways we can work on a watershed-wide level to mitigate damages to our most vulnerable areas? One example could be ensuring we have floodplains protected upstream so that high water has several places to dissipate as it makes its way downstream. Face the river. If we provide community members and visitors increased and improved opportunities to relate to our rivers through public access points, the economic benefits could be great. There are examples throughout the country, even the world, that we could look to. Urban whitewater parks, parks that host music, farmers markets, and food booths right at the river's edge, and gardens that also serve as stormwater treatment are just a few examples of community assets that are not huge economic losses if they flood. Bringing people to the river not only connects people to the natural world and their community, it can generate economic benefits without the vulnerability of building a permanent structure on a floodplain. The opportunities with this approach are incredible, and embedded in all of this is an eye on flood mitigation. BRC would like to help foster this different perspective. We see an unprecedented, exciting opportunity in Montpelier. This city is poised for change in many ways. There are numerous projects happening that promise to benefit the economic and cultural vitality of this city, including but not limited to one Taylor Street, Hampton Inn, <coughs> affordable housing behind Christchurch, an extension of the bike path, Caledonia Spirits, and a pedestrian bridge. Note that each and every one of these projects is along a river. Can we set the intention now to bring people to the river, to consider the natural characteristics of our rivers, and to let our rivers be rivers. Can Montpelier finally, once and for all, face the river? Thank you. Yes. We haven't worked out the timer yet, but that was 5.14. I, I, was, I was also and, timing that. And if you want me to, I'll be glad to do it. But people need to know exactly how much time you're giving them. I think, I think for now, why don't we just calibrate? ourselves. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Like Got it. Okay. We're, we're learning that this much writing is about five minutes, which is a useful, useful, a useful calibration. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name is Scott Muller, Montpelier resident. Um, a few questions and some comments. Um, the first off, is this the, has this been the first chance for public input on the draft? I think so. Um, then I would really request this study to improve it. You know, Section 9 is entitled Coordination and Public Input. If there hasn't been any, those sorts of statements should be taken out of the document. Um, <clears throat> the second is, um, as a member of the River Conservancy and the S Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, um, and, 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 and other relationships with the river, uh, as an environmental engineer, 
um, there's a lot of things that jump out of this study, and one is simply the lack of integration with all the other river activities going on in the space. And so um, the document was clearly written over a long period of time, and parts of it sort of contradict itself. Um, one of those, to your point earlier, Madam Mayor, was in the first page it talks about the importance of gradient in a river to control floods. And so I didn't really understand how you uh, offered recently that the dam may be mitigating flood activity. Um, so I would really encourage looking at removing those dams and the impact and the need for more cement in the river. The other is that um, there's a lot of drivers of change in this corridor that are happening. One was just, as Ricardo was mentioning, straightening out the river and pouring in cement. That has changed the whole geomorphology of the river, so now you have a flat, wide river that's filling in with sediment. Those flooding characteristics are very diff different than a normal meandering stream that can handle larger flushes. Um, so when you frame it as a do-nothing approach, that's you know a bit specious. I, I really think you need to look at a lot of the other solutions, such as dredging, such as encouraging meandering in the river. Some of those areas, uh, as Ricardo mentioned, have been filled in and gas stations placed right in the natural course of the river. There's nine gas stations in the floodplain right now within a mile radius downtown. So, you know, what is clear is that this mitigation structure, no matter how much money you spend on it, Montpelier is going to flood. And it's always going to flood. And if you look at NOAA's climate data, since 1950, there's eight more inches of precipitation that we're dealing with. The volume in the stream has gone up 25% since 1950, and it's continuing to climb. Montpelier is a city of five rivers, right? So there really needs to be a mature discussion that's integrated across all disciplines rather than just building more cement in the river. Um, it's a great, great opportunity to do that. There's many other cities that have done it. Most cities in the country built their backs to the river and are now trying to turn them around to embrace this as an asset. A great example is downtown Denver. Uh, 1968, when they had their huge flood, they created a Greenway Foundation. And it was actually the losing candidate uh, that was put in charge of that. All the businesses, all the uh, residential uses, all the different ecosystem ecological services in that corridor were represented. Now that's one of the highest per capita income zip codes in the country. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a really nice place to visit. Um, I think that's about all I have to say. Uh, I would just encourage more public involvement in this discussion. Um, you know, there's a lot of other options besides just hard, continuing to harden infrastructure, throwing more good money uh, after bad. Um, so, you know, count on the resources of all the different organizations in the city to help explore these solutions. Um, one that I thought was really interesting that seemed like an add-on in your study was rubber dams put in at the end. Um, I think many council members remember in 2014 we were here talking about removing the Bailey Dam and putting in a whitewater park there. That's a multi-million dollar asset the city can develop that many other cities are. Um, the most surprising part of that experience for us in presenting that case to the city was how little the city knew about the river. The city didn't know that they owned the Bailey Dam. People didn't understand that that was a reflection pool for the Golden Dome. You know, if you drive down Berlin Street, it's a beautiful picture of the, of the dome reflected in that pool. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of integration to happen. There's a lot of information out there to do that. Uh, downtown Boise actually put in one of those inflatable rubber dams, again, to control this. And that is uh, about the price tag you put in there. Um, that uh, inflates and deflates to sh change the shape of the wave. Some Tuesdays it's for surfboards, Wednesdays it's for kayaks. Um, so there's a huge asset there on top of this mitigation that I think is easier to sell to uh, the public. Um, and then the other was, what we discovered was, um, I think perhaps how much we're all underestimating the contamination at Grossman's Lot and the sedimentation that's occurred above Bailey. Um, someone needs to test that sediment. Um, it's probably severely contaminated. Um, but good luck. Count on our help. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, can I ask you one question? Bailey Dam, is that the, the same bridge as the, or I'm sorry, keep doing that. The closed pin dam? Is that the one that is at Main Street? Uh, yes, okay. right outside of Shaw's. 
Okay. Um, just wanted to make sure I had the right right name because I mean it could be confused with Bailey Street where there is no dam. And there's probably a sliver of history that would make the report better of how that mitigation ice mitigation structure was not working there, which is why they took it down in the 70s. That part was missing from the report as well. The ice mitigation uh, instrument wasn't working there. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We had also about five minutes. Okay. <laughs> calibrating. Yeah, it's good to calibrate. Um, okay, any other further discussion among us about this? Um, okay, great, thank you. So uh, we're going to end up getting another... Um, no action required. Yeah, we don't need to do anything now. And just to put it out there, I mean, we are... I, I mean, my hope still is to have a stormwater uh, group that's thinking about how we implement our stormwater master plan, and this seems to me like it would fit um, in with a, a group with that kind of expertise as well. Um, so I could see um, that group taking this on. It, that group doesn't exist yet, but <laughs> when it does. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for all of Thank your work you. on this. Uh, this has been fascinating. <laughs> we look forward to coming back. Good. Okay. Uh, so, just as a, um, did you have something? No, I was just going to tell him he can just shut my lid on my computer. I was going to get it out of your way. Um, I've been, I, so I did a little bit of uh, estimating ahead of time as to how long our agenda would take, and we're only 20 minutes behind. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were doing great until I just had so many questions about study. You know. Okay. Delicious. It's so delicious. Agenda item. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, citizen voting in elections also a fascinating topic yeah, um, I'll take that one because it came through me and I realize there's a couple big things left to go so I'll, I've got a lot to throw at you but I'll try to keep it quick um, so the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is that over the last I guess three uh, town meetings I've had questions from various folks um, asking it's always about their spouses, why their spouses uh, who are non-U.S. citizens can't uh, participate in the city elections and the municipal elections because they're, you know, they're longtime residents, been here for decades, maybe they've got kids in the school, they're property owners. And I mean, my response has always been like I was being asked, uh, you know, I don't know why are there so many songs about rainbows or something. You know, I, I smile and I nod and I thank them for their, their concerns and I, I just sort of like, but because I'm taking a class and getting a certificate on election administration, I have come to find out that it is not a crazy question. In fact, there is some degree or other of non-citizen voting in San Francisco uh, where non-citizen parents can vote for school board. Chicago, a similar arrangement. Municipal voting in Tacoma Park, Maryland since 1993. In Hyattsville, Maryland, Mount Rainier, Maryland, Barnesville, Maryland, uh, Martin's Editions in Somerset, Maryland, and Chevy Chase. And those are the ones I could, I could find easily. Um, internationally, it's an enormous list of countries that allow for various degrees of non-citizen voting, um, either e even at the, the national level in some cases, but often you know at the at the subnational level. Countries like Canada, Switzerland, Israel, Ireland, Denmark, Finland, Argentina, Austria, Belgium, Brazil, Estonia, Greece. It just goes on and on and on. So this is not unprecedented question. Now I spoke to a couple folks. Um, in Maryland, I spoke to the city clerk in uh, Tacoma Park, Jesse Carpenter, and I also spoke to the city clerk in College Park, Janine Miller. In College Park, they recently um, uh, 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 passed something at the city council level, but there was a lot of pushback, as she said, from outside groups, not so much folks inside. Um, and there was enough hubbub that when a, uh, a problem was found procedurally with their vote, they just didn't go back to it. So it did not happen in College Park, Maryland. But both clerks didn't indicate that there were any, you know, legal implications, any, any um, you know, consequences, for example, like there are with sanctuary cities. And I think it's because sanctuary city is a, you know, it's, a, it's got that shingle on it. It's like sanctuary trademark. It draws a lot of attention. And this, is, this is, does not so much, at least at this point. 
And there are certainly places where it's been attempted and it hasn't worked, uh, hasn't been approved. You know, m closest is probably Brookline, Mass. There was a, it was voted by the town and it was scuttled by the legislature and there have been efforts on and on, off and on in New York City for some time that may be getting some, 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 some footing now. Just for quick background, I don't want to ramble too long, but I want to give you all, all the facts here. Um, there is also historical precedent for this. There was non-citizen rights in most states for voting, at least with municipal elections, yeah, 40 states at one time or another, and those got scuttled by constitutional amendments generally between 1880 and 19, as recent as 1926. And this is also when poll literacy tests, poll taxes, uh, things like that were come up because there was a real anti-immigrant surge. Now in, in Vermont, the, the Constitution changed in 1828. So unfortunately, we were a little ahead of the pushback on immigrant surge there. Um, now, I should mention with Maryland, uh, it would be a different process here. Maryland is, is not a, a pure Dillon's rule state, so they have some home rule. So it's a question for them of just passing it and moving on. In our case, the process would have to be um, a charter change that would go through the legislature. Now, the, the impediments that are there is the first there's the constitutional question. And our constitution looks a lot like Maryland's constitution and a lot of other constitutions. Um, I believe the section 42, where I've got it here, uh, every person of the full age of 18 years who is a citizen of the United States having resided in this state for the period established by the General Assembly and who is of a quiet and peaceable behavior and will take the following oath or affirmation shall be entitled to all the privileges of a voter of this state. Now that of this state, the state privileges would, would drew my attention. And I actually talked to Dan Richardson, who, who wrote the memo that I sent you all out, and that was something, that was, that was a fairly conservative memo, and he was acting in a fairly conservative capacity um, as, a, you know, as, a, as an attorney. I spoke to him, and he said flat out, he agreed with my interpretation. He said, I, I don't think meaningfully Section 42 is an impediment to this. You know, your pen impediment is going to be in the legislature. Um, so. I, this, is the, this is the challenge that's out there. Um, my feeling is that since it's theoretically possible, even though it would face extraordinarily long odds in the legislature, obviously it would be a hot button issue, that the least I could do now that I know it's possibility is, is you know, not take on any kind of advocacy role, but, but facilitate the conversation. Um, I, you know, there are logistical issues. We do share our ballot with two other entities, the Public Safety Authority and uh, the, school, uh, the school board. And I've, you know, I've talked to Brian Ricca about, you know, let him know that this is, this is being talked about. So there are ways around all this. So what I would suggest, and what I'm gonna move forward on, this doesn't require any action on, on your part, but I think you all should be engaged in this is I'm going to set up a couple community conversations, a couple, a couple community meetings. One, just to have people show up and talk about it. See if there's actual interest. See if anybody shows up to, um, yeah. I just, so I was, this is the, one of the things that I was hoping that um, I intend to form a committee to focus on social and economic justice issues here in Montpelier. I think it's an area where we have a lot of work to do. And this is one area where I think it would be really good for that committee to do some work. Um, and I would love to sort of be a part of that conversation because I think that the decisions that we're making as a city impact everyone that lives here. Uh, and I wanna make sure that we have a full rich conversation about that. I think it'd be great to be involved. My recommendation would be that, that this, that you let this go as an independent conversation so it doesn't interfere with the other things that the committee wants to work on, but mm -hmm. it makes total sense. So if, if there's interest in a first meeting, then there can be a second meeting to talk about logistics. Um, and then if a charter change, and you've seen some language I sent out that's, I, I sent you all kinds of stuff. I just dumped stuff on you, but there's, you know, language that could be borrowed from another municipality there, and there's certainly other municipalities I could talk to. Um, if there is desire to pursue a charter change, and this far out we got a whole year, um, my strong recommendation, because there will likely be pushback from outside sources, that before, and you know, even if you all are supportive of it, 
Um, everyone I've spoken to in a community in a position of leadership is actually supportive of it. I would recommend you let folks then uh, petition this onto the ballot just to demonstrate that there is a base of support for it so that you're not taking on that, you know, the type of pushback you could get, particularly from outside groups, without some demonstration that, yeah, people are into this. And, um, and then, you know, that's not, wouldn't preclude you from passing some sort of resolution of support, but I would just be my recommendation. We're talking way out here. But, um, but yeah, so this, this community discussion ball is rolling, and just wanted to get the word out and bring you all in on it. I would just say, John, I would uh, enthusiastically support exploring this option. Um, so many barriers to citizenship exist in our country. And uh, just even on the campaign trail recently, I spoke to so many people who were not U.S. citizens, but were very much a part of our community, and I believe deserve to have a voice. Um, so I think at least having the conversation, um, that, that should absol absolutely be an option. So thanks for doing this, John. Sure, and just to be clear, you know, places that do this, they just they just don't hand them a state ballot, and they don't hand them a federal ballot. They're just getting a city ballot. And it's really interesting, the idea of thinking, is there a difference between being a citizen of your country and being a citizen of your community, which I'd never really thought of. But I think the community probably should have get to dis define what it considers a citizen of its community. Yeah. Well, when, these, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, when these constitutional amendments were passed, I think there was the fear of foreign nationals maybe infiltrating uh, you know, governments. Like, I would say that's a bit far-fetched that the British are going to try to take out Mayor Watson. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It would be the French. <laughs> right, sure. and, I, and I'm Irish, so I, I never say anything good about the British. I should toss in, too, that a couple years ago, you all may or may not remember, Burlington had some questions like this on their ballot. And that memo you actually that I sent out was prepared for, uh, for Burlington City Councilors. Um, there, they did not go for a charter change to, to, to make this possible. I'm not exactly sure why. They, um, maybe they just thought it would be too daunting. They instead put a question on the ballot that would have urged the legislature to begin the process of, of a um, constitutional amendment that would give municipalities the freedom to do that. Um, and it, it, it failed. Uh, I just want to make sure that I make the point that this is very distinct from that. I think what what folks are talking about, and um, certainly as the discussion that is beginning under me, as I understand it, is that it's about us. It's about what Montpelier wants to do, Montpelier should do, and not about something about the rest of the state and what the rest of the state should or shouldn't do. It's, it's, it's an internal conversation, and I think, that's, I think that's an important distinction. Just one sort of, I think it's just a terminology thing that I struggle with. I used to work in immigration law uh, before I came to Vermont. Um, and I see um, talking about uh, non-citizens and residents, I'd just like to be clear in the terminology that we use here. One of the sections said resident alien, which is, um, so if we, if, I mean, I, I guess the proposal is to allow lawful permanent residents. Yeah, that was just okay. on the on the no, no, cover sheet. Totally, I just yeah. sort of Googled what the legal term was. Yeah, and no, no, I just, mm -hmm. I, wanna, I wanna make sure I understand to you what the proposal is, which is lawful permanent residence. So people who are here with a green card is. Yeah, although, I mean, the proposal will be whatever the folks who put together the charter change want it to be. I right. mean, I'm not handing them one. Uh, right. And, and I, should, I also wanna say that I, I wanna facilitate this conversation. It's fascinating academically, and it just feels like an extension of my job. Should I decide to take on some sort of advocacy role in this, then I would, of course, recuse myself from certifying the final vote on the ballot, just the same as I would have done if I'd drawn an opponent. Probably get the BCA chair to sign off in my place, so. Any other comments on this? I, I think this is, uh, this is gonna be very interesting. I'm looking forward to the results. You know, if you have a meeting, who do, you know, do people show up? And, uh, you know, how do they wanna frame it? So. Uh, just keep us posted, I guess, on the time frame and how we can help get the word out. Sure. Okay. Any other? Uh, yeah, please. Hi. Uh, my name is Amanda Garces, and I live on Kent Street. And um, I have been here for about a year and a half. When I moved here, I was really afraid that I was going to come to a state that was 93% white, and my kids were not going to identify with my, my family and me. 
And I found a very multicultural place here in Montpelier, and I'm very excited to be here. Uh, Latinos are, we are the first, the biggest growing population here in Vermont. And I really would like to encourage you to not be afraid to become a sanctuary city if needed to be, or, or to really think through this to the community. We have our kids in school. We, we really have a very big Latino population here, but it's, does, it's not just Latinas. We have refugees here. Um, as you said, the becoming a citizen is really, really extremely difficult, and sometimes it takes a lot of money and hurdles. Uh, and the, in the meantime, people are here being part of your community, in school, at work, buying food, buying in the local places, and we would like to have everybody have the chance to vote. Um, I don't encourage to be for this to be on a ballot. I think that this should be something that the city council should promote, and uh, because it just opens up more possibilities of hate towards us. Um, so I think that taking a stand for people uh, is really, really important, uh, and I think that we are here, and we're not going anywhere, and we would like to be part of it. <laughs> uh, I am a citizen, so, so to make that clear, I voted in these elections, and I would, would love to have my friends vote it. Uh, I know many of them who are involved, who wanted to vote but couldn't, and who are part of a lot of committees and are part of making the city better. So I really <coughs> encourage you, it, it, it makes better for instead. I also would love to, be, uh, to have the undocumented population included. Uh, they might have kids in school, some people are married to undocumented, and that's just the reality, and uh, I'll be more than happy to support. I have been an immigrant rights activist for many years. I'm on the board of uh, Migrant Justice, and also have been involved in many of the uh, research that you have mentioned as well. So I will be more than happy to provide that support. Thank you very much for your comments. Yes, Jeff. Just to offer clarification on the process. Um, unfortunately, because we are we are a Dillon's rural state, which means, as they like to say, that towns are creatures of the state. It can't avoid the ballot. It has to go on the ballot, and then if it's approved, it, it, it then has to be approved by the legislature, who could just drop it. So the question is whether it goes on the ballot by having the council just vote to put it there, or whether there can be a petition of 300 people that would then put it there, or, you know, they could do both. But. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Scott, yeah. Just a quick point of clarification. Is it possible then if it has to be on the ballot that it can be a phased approach? Could it just be the school uh, system voting for, 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 for uh, school board? Or does it have to be comprehensive municipal elections? Well, the, the charter change would be whatever the charter change would be, although I think since the, I mean, it's more complicated with the schools. I mean, obviously, this is the municipality, so we're talking about the, the municipal elections. For the schools, I'm not sure how the schools could do that. For one thing, it's, it's with the, the, the new uh, district, the merged district with Roxbury, it's no longer a, a department of the city. It no longer has that direct connection to the city. It's an independent entity managed directly through the state. Um, so I'm not sure how that would even go, but that would have to be a conversation to have with the school board, and they'd have to look into that, and they'd have to get the process and, and going on their own. Take some sort of charter vote of the two communities, you know, the district members, and then. Well, it'd have to be a, a, this the school district bylaws. Um, of course, Roxbury doesn't have a charter, um, but, so it would but be the school district. Yeah, however, the yeah. governance structure is set up for them to make changes to. Yeah, and I'm not even we sure where to begin know. with that. We don't know about. Yeah. No, we're all making it up as we go along. Um, so there's no link to property taxes then with the school voting. With this new district merger, how, how is that, you know, uh, you know, for my family personally, it's difficult that my wife can't vote as a green card holder, mm -hmm. uh, despite paying property taxes and things. So now that there's a district merger, property taxes are still supporting the district school. Right, right. I mean, the, your tax bill, think of it like a funnel. You've got the, the, the school taxes, you've got the municipal taxes they come to, and they spit out into one paper, yeah. unless this god-awful bill in the legislature right now passes, in which case that's a whole other story. The but, the, but so, yes, I mean, we, we 
just because all those property taxes appear on one bill, the, the, the municipal and the school are really a distinct, are still distinct entities, even though they're both getting funded from property taxes. So there would have to be two separate ballot processes. Right. Well, so, yeah, so the school would have to, I think that's all we're trying to say. Yes, right. voting on the school still affects your property taxes like it does now. It's just because they're not under the municipal charter anymore. If we, before the merger, if the, the city chose to amend its charter that this is how it worked, then anything under that charter would have affected. Now, they're not in our charter, so they have, I don't know what their process yeah, is they're to their own that. thing. So, so, so if it were to work, essentially we would, we would have to give um, non-citizen voters a ballot that did not include school questions or public safety authority questions. Unless those two entities also make yeah. change. Great. Great questions. Lot, I think there are going to be a lot of questions lot to be sorted know. out, and that's fair. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, John, again, for taking that on. Okay. Uh, apartment inspections. So this is an item that we, that I, I feel like I had a hand in, in originating back when we put together our goals. Uh, uh, last year, and uh, anyway, I, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to to you, Bill, to talk about where we're we're at with that. So this is a combination of a of a holdover um, of from the, la the prior council's goals, and for me, keeping my word to Councilmember Hill, um, <laughs> who had pushed particularly hard for that to be on the goals. And at one point, we had it scheduled over the winter, and I asked her, could we please wait until after we got through the budget and everything, and then. We'd change so this is um, so it wasn't whatever that thing that made you not able to vote was about this but the disqualifier was you had to be of good behavior and that's right um, so it, essentially the issue um, the goal was to sort of discuss whether the city wanted to take on an apartment inspection program that could look like a lot of different things in its, in its sort of most concise <laughs> sense. And we have folks from the, the planning office here. Uh, Mike Miller, in fact, helped run one in Barry, so he could explain how, how these work particularly. But essentially, there's a fee paid by a department owner, and there are regular inspections to determine presumably life safety items. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. It's a, it's a big undertaking. So there's sort of two-part question. Number one, is this something we want to take on? If the answer is yes, we at least want to look at it uh, and cons take a deeper dive, then the suggestion is to form a working group, maybe not unlike the sprinkler committee, to then really say, does this make sense? You know, let's look at possible ordinances, let's look at what it really is going to cost and see what, what are we trying to accomplish by this, what, if not that, then is there something else we could do that helps tenants in their living conditions and those kind of things. So that, so to me, it's sort of, if, if one, then two is my suggestion. So. Um, yes, I want to do this. I will be as loud and non-peaceable as I have to be about this. Um, so one thing, there's an affordable housing coalition here, so it seems like something that they should be involved with. Housing task force. And the housing task force. Also, uh, this committee that we will get up and running for social and economic justice. I think having renters have access to safe, affordable, quality housing is a huge part of that conversation. Um, and I am, I, I will volunteer as tribute from the council to be heavily involved in that from District 3. I'm certain. <laughs> what the hear District 3? <laughs> <laughs> um, other comments on the apartment inspections? We should move forward on it. I have a committee. Yes. So just as another piece, so I had a conversation with the, um, uh, housing Task Force about this uh, a little while ago, and their thought was, uh, well, we don't seem to get, so let me preface this all <laughs> back up to two steps by saying I, I think this is worth looking into. Uh, but just I want everybody to be aware of the conversation that I, I had anyway, um, which is that, you know, when I went to the Housing Task Force, they said, well, you know, we're not getting the kinds of complaints uh, about housing that suggest that there are life safety issues. Uh, now, to be fair, that it might that might be an indicator that people don't know who to call, or it could be that, um, uh, you know, because we have a, effectively a zero percent vacancy rate, that maybe they're you know afraid of complaining. That's also possible. Um, so, I mean, another uh, uh, 
one of the things that we talked about in that, cover in that um, conversation was potentially the need for uh, some, uh, some renter outreach and you know, get in education, you know, letting them know who they ought to be contacting and what qualifies as something you should be complaining about. Um, and that might help uh, inform uh, you know, the, dis the discussion on a need for uh, inspections. So that's, that also feels like a, a good place to start in my mind. Um, so I guess I'll just leave that, leave that there. Yeah, I, I, I want to be clear to say that, you know, implementing a program like this is a very heavy lift. I mean, this is not just let's pass a policy. So I think <coughs> part of the, what I would hope would be studied is does it make sense to do that? What are the the actual scope of the issues, and if if it's not a full inspection program, then what? How do you get at it? What are the best ways to get at it? Because you know, certainly we want good quality housing for people and fair people, but I think we all we, we just want to make sure we're actually solving the problem that we yeah. have and that we're trying to target, and that we're looking at all the, the possible ways to do that. I, I am I the only renter here? I'm officially a renter. Okay. <laughs> um, so I I can tell you. <laughs> From my own experience, yes, this is this is an issue, and I've had some great places to live here in Montpelier that have been apartments, and I've had some that are way subpar. But setting my own personal experiences aside, I think that there's a whole lot of latitude in this, right? If we go into this with a sort of, we need to address a problem that, I mean, in my experience exists, and I know plenty of other people who, who have I'm not this saying issue. it doesn't no, exist. No, 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 I know, I, and I didn't take it that way. It's just, it doesn't necessarily have to be, this is the sort of, thing that comes out of this, but, you know, Burlington has a renter's bill of rights, for example. I mean, that's one way that we could, you know, sort of do some uh, renter outreach and sort of, you know, give people a way to sort of address these disputes or sort of a how-to, like, if this issue happens, here's, you know, what your what your options are. Um, and, and so I, I don't always see things so starkly contrasted, but I, I think that there's a lot of room here to do some really meaningful work in Montpelier for a population of people that hasn't always necessarily had a seat uh, at the table. Great. Uh, Glenn. Um, one other small point, just to, to keep in mind, and I'm sure we will, to, to keep a light touch uh, in some of this, because I can imagine situations where uh, renters might be in uh, a terrible place that is still better than no place. And if the city comes down on that, uh, could make that situation, at least for a moment, worse. So just to keep that in mind as this goes forward. Thank you. Great. Um, oh, yeah, please. Oh. So I just wanted to, uh, Mike Miller, I'm the planning director, and so I just wanted to go and say, um, suggest that if, if you're looking to do something, um, let's try to target the problem and not start with, uh, we're going to have a committee to explore whether or not we need an inspection program. An inspection program is a tool to fix a problem. Let's find out what the problem is. Um, say, let, give the housing task force an assignment to identify how to improve the quality of housing and we can move forward with trying to find tools that will improve the quality of housing. Or if we have health and safety issues, task them with coming up with programs and recommendations for how to fix health and safety issues. Um, as opposed to saying, how do we get to this inspection program, which maybe, you know, let, let's find a problem that makes this a solution that we can adopt. Um, let's start with the problem. And then we can all work together to, to kind of come up with the best solutions. And maybe it's an inspection program. And maybe it's Great, thank you. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Let's start with assessing the problem. Um, any other thoughts from the public? Okay. Uh, great. So I, I, it sounds like we're holding off on that until we have a to appoint the committee. Yeah. But, yeah, but that is that the plan we're going to go? So we'll make that and yeah. add that to the list of committees for <laughs> the next meeting. Great. Yep, I can see that being a even like a standing committee like me. Yeah. Or folded in some of the other. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, okay, great. Um, uh, administrative department presentation. Okay, my goal for this is to make it as brief as possible. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we, as you know, we have planned to 
have pres presentations in all the departments, and I think the larger departments will have much more full presentations accompanied with site visits. Um, these are not particularly controversial areas, but we do have uh, the finance director is here, the clerk is here, I'm here. Make them controversial. We can make them. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think the main point of this was to <laughs> apply. So the whole presentation is the one chart with the list, and I think we want to make sure that you are clear what sort of what each department was responsible for, what the staffing level were, who the people are that do that, um, and I think you know in terms of, uh, I think the clerk and the finance director can talk about emerging issues in their department. I think largely for the manager's office, the emerging issues are whatever is emerging across the city and the council goals and priorities and those sorts of things. That's really what we're responding to. I think internally it's a lot about improving our technology, improving our communications, improving those kinds of things, how we can do all of that better with the public and with you all. Um, and for the assessor, I did speak with him and he just asked me to um, share that we are that there is a, a boom in the housing market right now. Prices are going up. And so we are at, what, at uh, a 92% uh, valuation rating versus uh, 100%. So at, when you reach 80, you must do a complete revaluation. So we still get some time. It could be anywhere from two to five years before we have to do it again. But it's not forever either because of, you know, we're now seeing sales maybe at $100,000 over price and assessed value. So, so what the state says is we want our we want our assessments to be as close to reflecting the actual market as possible. And so anything below 100 is reflecting a difference between our um, common level of appraisal, it's called, and the actual values. So it's dropped down to 92 now. He thinks that when this year's sales come in, it will drop even lower. When you hit 80, you're required to do it. So he's just saying that is an emerging issue, not a, not maybe for this year, but we could be thinking about. Um, starting to set money aside for that. It's not an inexpensive proposition. It's certainly very, um, it's a big issue. Any of you that's been through it before as a resident, and certainly as a council member and a city official, it's it's not the most fun you, you'll ever have. <laughs> um, but it's important because it's an equitable, the issue of equity. Can I ask a dumb question? Sure. What does it entail? It entails creating a new property value for every property in the city. Everyone gets inspected. Everyone gets a new, everyone gets inspected and a new, uh, so you have inspection cost and you have valuation computer models. And everyone, all of you are on the board of civil authority. <laughs> <laughs> so he, that means all the you appeals. So someone, <laughs> who, someone whose house might now be valued at 200000 gets a new bill and now it's 300 or new value and it's 300000 They're like, my house isn't worth this. So then they appeal and you have to make sure you have the right number of bathrooms and bedrooms. And the, the, the biggest problem we face with these, is, and it's just totally understandable, is that the tax rate is based on the total value. So when you, you, when you do these, the value goes up so the tax rate drops. But intuitively, a person says, well, I was at 200 now into 300, my taxes are gonna go up by a third because they're not factoring in the tax rate. So you have a lot of understandably panicked people. And it's just, it's just a, a lot of work and it's a lot of, you hear a lot of complaints and the process takes a long time, and it's very important to do it right because, again, um, you know, someone's going to say, "Well, here's mine and my neighbor. Why, you know, mine's this and my neighbor's that. Why, you know, why?" And sometimes there's a good reason, and sometimes, you know, it's like, "Oh, well, we missed that you have two bedrooms and they have three or something," and so you got it. And then, you know, then the neighbor gets an increase. So it's it's it's. But the flip side of it is the most important thing of our tax system is that it's got to be equitable. And if, it's, if we're basing our revenue sources on the value of property, it's important to keep it in. And the reason the state requires, of course, is there's a statewide property tax. So, so they want to make sure that those values are equitable across the whole state. And that's why they, they factor. Um, so that's, he just wanted to say that that's not imminent this year, but it's also not like in a decade away. Um, and Similarly, a couple years ago, he pitched a proposal for a revaluation of personal property, which is the business personal property, and we've already exempted the, the lower amounts. But again, you've got, we sort of are relying on self-reporting. And now again, it would be a, a proposition, but it, it would create more equity. So if that's something we want to hear more about, we can arrange on that. Um, so I'll let the finance structure and the clerk talk about any, if they want to, about any emerging issues that they have. 
my emerging issues are staff and time. Uh, as you heard earlier, Ruth is planning on retiring uh, this year. And uh, we're fortunate that our other staff accountant, Heather Graves, is scheduled to go out on maternity leave in September of next year, which is uh, right about the same time as the audit next is year kicking off. <laughs> this year, yeah, sorry, next 2018. Year yeah. September of 2018. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I apologize, this year. Uh, we're auditing 17, we're in 18, budgeting 19, it gets confusing. Um, so that's really the big uh, item on my horizon is how to manage a staff person, a senior staff person that's departing, how to build an incoming staff person and then also fill the voids. Um, some of the ways we can get there is through efficiencies in our processes, um, but those sure, those very efficiencies require time investment on the front end, which is something that's at a premium for us right now. So um, streamlining the processes, working through st staff transitions and also looking at IT uh, infrastructure uh, improvements in the next couple of years or sooner. Um, we have things that need to be addressed. Um, we have aging servers. We have uh, discussions to move to cloud-based services that are pretty important, but also impact day-to-day -day operations uh, within the city. So, um, And everything comes at a cost as well. So we have been limping along, but that's something that needs to, uh, that we need to take a serious look at. So um, beyond that, I think those are my four biggies. Oh, emerging issues. Um, yeah, what do you all need to know is coming? Uh, oh, you don't need to know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say the in the clerk's office, we've been, uh, you know, we've been shorthanded. There's a staff position that hasn't been filled, but honestly, there's been so much streamlining of the clerk functions and processes over the years. We made it work for this last election, and I think we may just be able to keep that up, although we almost for sure have to get temp help around the general election or we'll be doomed. Um, uh, the other issue that could be on the horizon, as you all should be aware of H911, which is uh, in now in Senate finance. I was hoping to go down and testify on it tomorrow, but I forgot I had a previous commitment, but I know some of the clerks are getting involved. This is on a, on a fast track. It was a committee bill out of Ways and Means. Um, once it came out of Ways and Means, it was through five days. And if it passes, it's a massive education finance thing. And one of the things in it would, it would require us to send out two tax bills. Uh, one for, and I didn't actually verify this, but I think it's for the state part of the of the property tax and everything else. So that would be, it would double our costs for printing. It would take a lot more person power, and the amount of chaos it would cause, I, I cannot understate. I mean, people are going to be confused. They already call us confused all the time. The, the amount of calls we're going to get, people stopping in confused and angry is going to skyrocket. Delinquencies are going to skyrocket because people are going to say, I paid my bill. What is this? So if that happens, we're in some deep doo-doo. So if you all, I would, you know, anybody who knows any, any legislators and wants to lean on them, God, please get them to strike that, that, uh, that part of it. So those, that, that is a potential lurking issue, yes. <laughs> what committee is it in charge? Right now, it's in um, Senate Finance. And, you know, Ann Cummings is the, the chair, and she's a former mayor right up there on the wall, so hopefully she has, um, would have a, you know, a, a particular appreciation for the kind of bomb that would be in my office. And lastly, we want to make sure you guys have any any questions for any of us about the functions of these offices? Again, we can certainly um, take you on tours of City Hall and what we do, but just in general, what, what goes on. And maybe it's, it's, I, I realize these aren't the most, mm -hmm. nobody runs for office to talk about accounts payable, but <laughs> nonetheless, it's an important <laughs> function. It's essential. <laughs> it is essential, but I, you want to make sure you've, you've had a chance to, to get familiar with this at, now or at any point in the future. So. So any questions for any of these folks or? on this document. Okay, 
Okay, I have one. Oh, yeah. Tom. I don't have a question, but just thank you. Thank you all. Oh, you're essential. Sorry you don't get your stars on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a clean audit to me. And that's right. Yeah, right. That's a really big <laughs> like deal. It is a big that's deal. That's like yeah. three gold stars. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I have a, one question. It's a, it's about this uh, document that we have here with the with the structure. Um, in terms of key functions, maybe maybe this is not a key function, but um, under the, the finance uh, and, and treasure um, heading, uh, I just want to honor the work that I know you are y'all are, are doing about um, keeping track of uh, our, our energy for the mm. city. And so uh, if it were me, I would suggest <laughs> mm. that we, oh, wait, it is me. <laughs> um, I guess I would, I would suggest that we add a bullet point for um, energy tracking, um, unless we decide that that function lives with someone else. Well, it certainly lives in the finance office. Mm -hmm. I, I actually, I, I realized as I'm looking at this, I actually didn't put accounting on there. I would think that that belongs in the county. So. It's a key yeah. mess. Yeah, fair. <laughs> fair. Um, and but putting that information together has been arduous, and Kate yeah. Stevenson may disagree with your opinion of us uh, taking care of that, per se. But, uh, but we are working diligently to get the, um, the baseline information, the addition of the solar panels on Log Road and Novus, uh, Broadbrook and, and Sharon um, have put a little bit of a wrinkle in, in some of our yeah, um, billing country. procedures. Uh, so we're continuing to work through that. We're continuing to work with the vendor to get it uh, so it's a little bit more clear to us. Um, and hopefully we'll be presenting to council next month, or that is that will be happening next month, as far as our FY17 energy usage and the improvements that we've made. So bear with us. Yeah. No, I understand, mm -hmm. and that's even a new process. Um, but I, you know, I do hope that, I mean, eventually, right? I, I will not be sitting here, and I, I hope that that is a practice that continues mm -hmm. even beyond, mm -hmm. you know, my advocacy for it. So, uh, super, thank you. Wow, second meeting. She's talking about her exit strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> like yeah, it's someday. <laughs> it's good, good to keep it in mind. All right, thank you. Um, uh, I guess that's it for for this item, unless anybody else. And has at any time, if anyone has any questions, <laughs> as you know. Okay, so we are at council reports. Uh, what about your committee assignments? Oh, just kidding. What? Clarification, the add-on item about. The we have the committee. Some committee. Oh, the committee on committee stuff. Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Committee's report. Right. So. That was the addendum. Yes. Forgot about the addendum. So, uh, who am I turning to for this one? Someone plays the chair. Ah, you want to explain this one? Um, so, uh, the Committee on Committees, which is actually a thing that exists at the legislature as well, so people who gave me some grief for that, I did my research, and it is actually a committee that exists in many different places. Um, so we met, and one of the things uh, that uh, I've been really interested in doing since um, stepping onto the council is really making sure uh, that we have an equitable process by which people can ap uh, apply to be appointed to committees um, and to um, sort of really get a full idea, a full picture of who someone is as an applicant. Um, and so we met and made some changes to uh, the or created an application form, really, um, and um, really just sort of want to get a sense for why people want to serve on these committees and sort of what they're looking to do on these committees. Uh, and the other piece is um, ensuring that committees are um, fulfilling state meeting require state open meeting law requirements um, and um, posting their agendas and getting their minutes up to date as well. And it's something, it's an ongoing process for all of us here in the city, um, but it's something that I really am committed to doing. I want people to be involved in our city governance and uh, I think committee service is a really great way uh, to do that. And uh, I want to make sure that we're sending a message as a council that we will consider every applicant um, and, and look at these factors that we uh, were really clear in including uh, on our form. And, and it went through a few iterations, thanks to Connor, who put it all together. Um, it went through a couple of iterations on the committee and what we have brought to you uh, as the council is what we distilled it down to. So, thoughts on 
But so really, we're we're looking at this document that you've put together. Yes. And do we do we like that? And so the idea is that this is something that, for any appointment, mm -hmm. we would ask somebody to fill this out. Yes. Right. Yes. Go ahead, right John. now, we just ask for a resume and, and some uh, aspect of why you're interested in the committee, and this would be a form that we would use. And I especially like the, the second paragraph that's really talking about we're seeking diversity right up front, and likewise. On the last page, we talk about um, that we really are asking people and are going to be counted, account, accountable for participating, for attendance and participating in their committees. So it's a little heads up that when we come to reappointment, there'll be some assessment going on. And I'm just hoping people don't find it intimidating. That's the only thing I worry about it. It's three pages. <laughs> But the idea is to try to emphasize as much about people's interest as their professional life and get a more balanced picture of the person. And I think we could probably make it a, a, like a, an internet-based form where you can just fill it oh, out yes. entirely online so you don't have to worry about finding a printer and then yeah. being able to read handwriting. Um, but I think I, I'm not always fond of standardizing things. I don't, I don't tend to fit well into square boxes, you know, round peg, square hole. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of value, you know, sort of just, just observing city politics as someone not on the council and sort of being here now. I, I, I think this is a really valuable tool for us to have. So uh, I have a few questions. But do you all have questions first? Uh, so, I mean, one of my questions was how do you, you how do we anticipate receiving this? Uh, one possibility is that it's electronic and people can fill it out online. I love the idea of not requiring a printer. I, have, I think for other folks who, you know, want, who, who, want, um, uh, who maybe are, are not using computers, uh, I think it would make some sense to have printed versions of this available. Absolutely. Um, in the, the city hall mm -hmm. um, So there's that. Uh, but other other questions. So there was a, I, I probably should have just suggested this before now, but I had a couple of uh, questions about the, um, the form. One place, I, I guess I would, I know this is a small edit, but um, I, uh, one place you asked, like, are, do you anticipate being conflicted? And there's just a yes, or, a yes or no, and it would just make sense to me that if someone were to get an answer yes, that you'd allow them to explain, like, you know, I, I run an ultimate Frisbee day camp through the rec department, so does that make me conflicted? Well, let me just tell you that up front. <laughs> and so then you please explain it right so uh, offering a place where people can explain their conflict I think would be good and then later on it um, it has a place where it says uh, please note that members will be evaluated on a regular basis to ensure that uh, their active participation and contribution to the group's goals and mission um, I think what you mean there is we're just going to check attendance unless we're unless it means more yeah go ahead oh. Donna Jamie, who's been just an incredible uh, assistance to all of our council craziness, but especially all the committees and the committee appointments, when I went to talk to her, she talked about how important it is, and she's willing to keep attendance. She does get the minutes, but she's also looking at some committees, she doesn't get minutes, and she doesn't get their agenda, so she ends up putting an agenda. So there is some level of participation that we can garnish through her, and then I think there's other levels that we can ask the chairs to do if we decide to do more. But uh, I guess my suggestion would be like that, uh, for, for someone who, you know, likes to get an A, um, that might be a scary statement uh, okay. because it's not clear how you're being evaluated. Um, so if we said, we're going we're gonna to check to see if you're showing up to your meetings, and we're going to check to see that the committees have uh, logged their minutes or whatever it is. Um, but we, if we can be just really specific about that, um, rather than in, are, are, are you contributing towards the group's goals and mission? Like that, that's a little, it's a little broad. Yeah. Well, the, the minutes and the agenda get down into more detail that we thought would come later because the individual person is here whether as the function of the committee comes back to minutes and agenda. Mm -hmm. 
versus the person can be responsible for attendance, and you can word that instead of participating, but also that when they come, they're contributing to the goal, the working of the committee. So if you have other words, that's fine, but I, I guess I want more than them attending and sitting there like a warm body. Sure. I just don't know being how. Being disruptive. Or being disruptive, <laughs> yes. So they're supportive <laughs> moving forward. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know how we would evaluate someone on that, on that second part. Well, we do all the time. We ask the chair, and we go to your point. We ask all sorts of questions and evaluate them on that. So I thought up front, we can just tell them we're going to evaluate them on that. We don't tell them exactly how. Maybe you could say something like, you know, instead of please note, and so, 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 putting someone on notice, maybe yeah. say something, attendance, being prepared, um, productive participation, adherence to open meeting laws, and public record laws are, are very important. You know, please acknowledge that you understand this or something like that. Okay. Yeah. That was the spirit, I think. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Those well, were at least somebody got those, those words. words. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. Thanks, Lou. You got that down. Some participation. That's well, Orca has it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Um, so, how do we want to move forward with this? I mean, so yeah. I, I think what the committee was looking for was an approval from the council to go ahead and certainly I like I think Bill's changes. Yeah. I, I consider that a friendly amendment. <laughs> um, and so I think what the committee was looking for was council approval to go ahead and use this form. We have some committee appointments coming up. Um, and I, you know, obviously we have an appointment to make next week. Um, and just to sort of, you know, to sort of get people in the process of starting to think about all of these points and not just, you know, longevity. Um, I also just want to check in with Jamie about this because you're going to be the person who is, you know, taking, uh, taking these documents or if it's electronic, you know, vetting them somehow. And, and when people just submit a resume, probably, you'd probably be the one that was like, actually, you got to fill this out. Right. And just, um, do you want to do you want to come up here? Yeah. So on the eleventh, there are appointments to four different committees, and we've already advertised for that. We already have yep. the letters and the resume, so um, <coughs> it really doesn't matter to me. My concern was how, the, like you know, for people who aren't going to get it electronically, they might have to come in to pick it up. Um, I get people who mail uh, resumes and letters of interest, so. Um, it would just be another step, you know, someone, you know, coming to City Hall to pick it up or calling and saying, how can I get it? Um, so, but I, I really, I think it's, I think it's fine. Also, just maybe a suggestion. Um, Bill, the things that you were saying um, regarding the evaluation, what if it's, you know, simply a, you know, I agree to, um, you know, all these things, and if, be evaluated based on right. my yeah. like yeah. yeah just a check off box so I, I have a suggestion for moving us forward is perhaps you, if you, if you're in general agreement with this you can authorize the city manager's office to implement this with making the minor changes as discussed that we yes. can sort out how we want to do it and then we can figure out how we're going to mail them to people and you guys don't have to worry about it and, just, and they can print them off we probably start it fill them off sure. online that and then we can set a start for the next round of yeah. things that aren't already in progress, yeah. we'll say right. after these April 11 appointments, we'll yeah. start this. So would anybody like to make a motion? Thank you. So moved. Second. <laughs> and it's clear what we're voting on. So we are authorizing the authorizing city manager the to. Giving us free reign. Right. <laughs> and I, yes, I just wanted to mention, I, to tell me I did leave on uh, people's desk three uh, items related to committees. These are committees have gotten this through emails again and again. Jesse Baker sent a lot of things out about the open meeting law and taking minutes and uh, wonderful Jamie has followed up on this. So I just thought you all should know what we've been asking them and hopefully that we will offer them a workshop this coming year. Because Vermont Leagues of Cities and Towns really does a wonderful job about the open meeting law. I think it would help all of our committees and many of us. <laughs> Great. Okay, I think we're now at the point of council reports. Wait, did we vote on that? Oh, we did not vote. Thank you. I was just like, oh yeah, clearly. Every I'm vote counts. Uh, okay, so any further discussion? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Great. All right.
Oh my gosh, for the third time. Council reports. Uh, we're, I think we started over there last time, we right? Did. So Donna, oh. you want to start us off with something? Well, I had the privilege of helping Lost Nation Theater with their egg hunt today. And especially a lot of little toddlers. But the family started lining up at 5 o'clock. The door does not open till 5. They all rushed in. And within five seconds, it seemed, but definitely five minutes, like some 200 eggs are gone. And they're all full of candy. It was just wonderful, and I really appreciate Law Station Theater sponsoring it. Thank you. Uh, working on a little side project here. Um, I was interested in finding out that Montpelier did not have a sister city. Um, so I did call Sister City International. Um, I, I, I do think it, it is a great way to have a cultural, economic exchange with another community that you maybe share something in common with. Um, I'd asked a number of people, and one idea that came to mind was um, we do have about 282 uh, Bosnian refugees living in Montpelier and the surrounding areas here. Uh, I think it's a segment of the population that at times can be ignored, and uh, given the Islamophobia uh, going across the nation, um, a, a good way to address this might be entering into a sister city with a Bosnian community. Um, a lot of these folks came over here uh, from an absolutely war-torn place. Uh, Sarajevo, for example, uh, people lost an average of 30 pounds um, during the Bosnian War. Um, so uh, Vermont Refugee Resettlement would be happy on working with that, but I, I just wanted to open up the concept of it. Um, and I, I'd love to work with anybody who had an interest in it. Um, may, maybe it's another community we look at, but I, I just think it's a good idea. and. Uh, Happy to report back on that soon. Great. Thanks very much. Um, I want to announce here that I've been uh, holding a weekly morning talk every Thursday morning for the last few weeks, um, and that will continue. I have a, a, a venue for the time being, uh, Open Hands Cafe in Christ Church Parish Hall, every Thursday from 8.30 to 9.30, and this is uh, basically a way for me to uh, hear directly from residents, for me to pass on anything that I might have heard here uh, and, and answer questions. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing it. Uh, if nothing else, it's a good place for me to get some email done uh, if no one shows up. <laughs> um, and uh, Open Hands Cafe is a, a great place if you haven't been there. Uh, George Estes makes uh, really wonderful scrambled eggs um, <laughs> and it's a nice quiet uh, at least when I've been there really quiet and pleasant so uh, 830 to 930 every Thursday open hands uh, in Christ Church Parish Hall I would just like to uh, applaud uh, uh, our police here in Montpelier for a very successful uh, rally this weekend and also commend our youth and everyone who supports them in all that they are doing to, to really get active and be engaged in the process. Um, I attended uh, and was really, um, really heartened to see so many young people that were so attentive and were so connected to what was going on. Um, unfortunately, it's you know, it's a, it's a really tough topic and it's a very emotional topic and a lot of people have had a lot of really um, intense experiences around uh, the firearm conversation and um, even the people who were there to count counter protest uh, really conducted themselves uh, in, in an upstanding manner and um, it was a wonderful event that was well attended by folks from all over the state. Uh, I also ran into uh, some Canadian folks that attended the event as well so I, I just I really want to commend the city on on making this uh, an, an event that was open and accessible to everyone including dissenting viewpoints uh, and for really uh, maintaining a an environment that supported everyone there. Uh, so I have just a couple things. Uh, apparently, April 3rd is a National Day of Recognition for uh, AmeriCorps members, and uh, I was approached about uh, passing some kind of a resolution recognizing them, and so I have some language that we can start with for that. I don't think we're going to get it out in time for April 3rd, but... Um, I always do a mayoral. Oh, is that, is that a big, just make it <laughs> a, big, well, you a can, thing? Well, they give you a head nod. Yeah. So, uh, 
Uh, okay. If, if, so without I would move. Yes, I, was, I would move that we uh, delegate the authority to the mayor to. <laughs> Right, I mean, to, yeah. to, to acknowledge uh, all of our AmeriCorps volunteers here in uh, Montpelier. I second it. They've been wonderful. Wonderful discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed. Right. Great. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, add to the list, right? Uh, cool. Well, I'll, I'll forward on that draft language anyway. Okay. Um, so that's one thing. Um, secondly, I just wanted to check in on the status of. Uh, uh, a timer for, or like a tablet for the timer for people. Um, still hoping for that. Uh, I do think it was good that we actually spent a little time calibrating tonight. I mean, I appreciate that, you know, thoughtful comments written out, two pages, took about five and a half minutes. And is that is that a reasonable amount of time? Do we want to go shorter? Um, it depends yeah, I mean, depend on the people. topic. Well, it depends on how many people. I, I, I really do feel like it's tough to, you know, I know you want to have, create a consistency, but. Like, that, that was great. If there were yeah. 20 people here five minutes each, we couldn't do it. Right. And, you know, I think sometimes you have to say how many people want to speak on this. Sure. Okay, sure. how about so one minute each or okay, something so like that. Okay, so we can do that. And then say, yeah. and we're going to time you, even if it's just using our phones, so we can right. say, you know, we're going to. Right. And, you know, maybe we can, um, I mean, if we. I think still having a uh, vi some kind of visual for is it big enough. Mm. If you turn well, it, if it's the person there, can you turn it sideways? They're talking. Right is there a way to like prop right it up? Here. You know? Well, if there is the person standing next to Don. Yeah, then that would be. That, I mean, that would work. Well, I, I should think. Jamie and I have talked, but it's trying to do something that I don't have to constantly be. Touching. Okay. But anyway. Um. Okay, and then. But, but the other thing. <laughs> like projected. <laughs> Oh, yes, Don. Especially, though, when you have it written out, to me, I don't want somebody to read it word for word. I would rather they just pull the essence and give us mm -hmm. that the, dark, the, pr the printed sure. to our considerations later. But the thing that's on my radar, too, and uh, I mean, it's, it's nice to be talking about it when it's not you know, an urgent question, but to figure out what our protocol ought to be when it is an urgent question. Um, I mean, we're going to give people a heads up. You know, you've got about 30 seconds left. <laughs> or you know, like try to wrap it up in the next minute or whatever it is, you know, however long we... Well, if you give me an idea what you want, I mean, I actually do have cards. I do it all the time. <laughs> Green, right, orange, right. and red, depending on... Okay. Like. So uh, maybe that's, you know, if there's a lot of people that are here to talk about something, we'll just establish, we'll see who, we'll see what the interest is, and then... I think it. another, another uh, key yeah. issue is what else is on the agenda, too. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if we have two or three major topics, and we've got to get through them all. Like tonight, you all knew there was probably no real heavy lifting after the flood thing, so all right, I'm going to If there had been zoning or something after, then it's also like we got to we gotta keep going. We gotta keep this going. Um, and I forgot to say uh, Actually, I was, some places um, have a sign-in sheet for people. If, if you know, they, they have yes. clipboards over there, and if people want to, are here to speak on a certain issue, Sometimes it's really helpful to just be able to check that list and see how many people want to speak on a certain topic, and then you can sort of allocate accordingly. If we know that we have X number of minutes and there are X number of people, that mm -hmm. it's just it's it's another way, and and maybe even like having sort of a an you know a <clears throat> just a welcome to a city council meeting. You know, here's you here's the agenda. Be? If you want to speak, please sign on sign in on this list and for this topic and. It just seems like maybe that could be a way to sort of get an idea to gauge. But I can picture doing that when there's a topic that we know is going to bring out a lot of people. Um, so, okay, well, all ideas. options. So another idea, you know, because the other, the other thing is people come in during meetings, and, you know, sometimes they come into the back. You, you can use the, a lot of times we know which item people are here for, too, right. you know, just because of who they are. But you can always say at the beginning of each, I don't know. How many? Are no, there, there are people here for this particular? I just want to make sure you know you have a chance to be heard, or you know, feel it out. Uh, the point I just forgot that I was going to make was about the reading. I, you know, that's it is something I tend to agree to too. On the other hand, having watched these meetings for a long time, a lot of people get really nervous, yeah, yeah. and so they've written it out because they want to remember to say what they want to say. So I know they're reading what they've already written, but they still want to say it. But so I, I think we need to be a little bit. Two pages of reading to me is just. 
But, yeah, go ahead, Don. But likewise, I think there should be the encouragement that people should expect to only speak once when you have a big crowd. Sure. Mm -hmm. We get people speaking three, four times, and mm -hmm. I just don't think that's fair. Yeah. No. And, and I'm wondering if, like, a, just a maybe like an expectation, like, like just a list of, like, you know, so, sort of, I don't know, expectations is the right word, or just like what to expect at a city council meeting, you know, uh, if there's, if they're, you know, maybe speaking one time, it, I don't know. It just seems like some something that would sort of help to manage our expectations at, coupled with the sort of desire to be transparent in what we're doing as city government and including people in that process. Um, it, it might be a nice way to, to sort of handle some of that. I don't know if dissonance is the right word, but. Yeah, yeah well, just having, I think especially with contentious topics, having clear guidelines. 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 It's, it's useful. Those we could post up. That'd be, yeah. yes, yeah. that would be, I think that would be really I'm putting that on my to-do list, I think, as well, but like, let's uh, come up with some, some guidelines or. Shared understanding. Yes, yes. yes. I said, that's it for me. Oh, I got nothing. Okay, I do have two or three things. Um, good news, the, the Moet permit was issued this morning. So that's, um, the zoning permit was issued, so now we're setting a closing date. Um, so that is very good news, that's happening. Um, the city clerk informs me that the charter changes have been uh, sent to the Secretary of State and we are both monitoring to see when they appear before a committee. We'll do some promptings and get those, the ones that were just passed. Sorry, I just want to back up a sec. <laughs> so, uh, we're, you're setting a closing date for the Moat for the Moat thing really soon, and then <coughs> we're setting a party date <laughs> the day after. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Anyway, groundbreaking. <laughs> yeah, there we go. When there's actually something. Yeah. Um, so the charter changes. Right. We're, we're mo monitoring that. I emailed out to you uh, that there's a public safety forum on April second. Um, just. FYI, you're all welcome to attend if you wish. Chief Fakus is on one of the committees. I also wanted to mention the protests. Thank you for mentioning that, Ashley. Uh, it really was a great event in the city, and I really want to commend our staff and the state. And Sue was there all day, starting at eight in the morning. Um, I, I don't think, you know, maybe some when when the police and fire are here doing their reports, maybe you can ask them because the amount of preparation that goes into that. Um, really goes way beyond what I think people really understand and, um, and the, the things that they're watching for that the, the citizens are, you know, for example, a, a state worker happened to come in cleaning an office during the event and opened a window and, you know, the state police were right on top of that. Like, why is a window suddenly opening? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, boom. And those are things that people down just don't think of, but they were like, oh, this could be our worst night. Turned out it was just a convenience person getting some air and they like, keep the windows closed. So I mean, I just they're really diligent, and and um, it takes a lot of prep and many multi, you know for these meetings that we know are coming, the ones that we you know there's a lot of planning, and so. And they're also friendly, professionally friendly. It's just amazing. Yeah. And so you know those are that is part of the cost of serving the capital city. When we talk about the needs of our local services, they're you know helping protect everyone and. To be fair, state police and capital police were you know, great partners. They were what we wanted to know. Uh, lastly, uh, we have talked about that the, the um, strategic planning session. This is a first in my career that everyone could do the dates on the first <laughs> throw and, and okay. throughout. Even Alex, I checked just in case. <laughs> so it was, uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, so that's a go. The question, I spoke with a consultant today, and I'll send you more information about this because it really was just wrapping this up this afternoon. She wanted to know, particularly on the Tuesday date, the 22nd, what the earliest possible time was you all felt you could do it. I mean, I know, uh, like, three in the afternoon? No. No. Sorry. <laughs> I just, it, no, I. No, no, I know. I, that's, I told her I'd ask. I, I, 4.30, and that, from Barry to Montpelier, so 4.45. Five o'clock. I make myself available. I just have ultimate practice, but I can leave early. Five o'clock would probably work for me. Got the same. Okay. I'm flexible. Okay. Well, I, that's helpful to know just what to plan on. So I think the, the plan is the general outline is kind of what I said is that that on 
in that case, we might be doing five, two nights in a row. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that the Monday night session be just us talk about some of the governance issues, the retreat type issues for the first part, but then start getting into big process. You know, start thinking about big picture goals for the council. We're going to talk priorities. She'll work with our staff on during the day on Tuesday. So get our issues in. in then we'll all be together Tuesday night to, to cook together, complete the plan, which is why she wanted as much time as possible with everybody. So, there we go. We'll do the best we can with what we've got. I mean, I realize everyone has, has realized. The other piece of this, those of you who participated in the retreat last year, remember that this happened. Uh, as it gets closer to the date, she will be calling me individually. It's no, it's her name's Julia Novak. I'll send you information about her. Uh, to the municipal government. Does this, this is kind of what she does in strategic plans for municipalities. One of the best things. Kind of good person. Um, so she'll be calling each of you to try to get a sense of what your big issues are. So she'll understand and, and procedural concerns and governance concerns and norms and practices. So she'll have some sense, and same with our staff folks, to, to, so that she'll know coming into it. More to come, but those are confirmed dates now. So from five to so. so that <laughs> that does raise the question. Um, Glenn heartily volunteered, but nobody else commented that um, that is a council week. So, um, but it's also a five-week month. So we could move the council meeting to the 30th from the 23rd if you didn't want to do three nights in a row. I have to decide that right now, but it's something to think about. And the 30th? So, yeah, so normally we would be the 9th and 23rd that yeah, month. No, that's the week after our Memorial Day weekend. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, no. I, people want, I, it doesn't matter to me. But if, Sorry, Donna, are you saying keep I, it on the 23rd? I would rather yeah. keep it on the 23rd. Oh, it doesn't right. matter. Is that not good for you? Glenn? No, no, I think uh, Glenn, Glenn, Glenn volunteered right. to do three nights in a row. I just, yeah. Nobody yeah. else responded to that. <laughs> okay, that's fine with me. I, so three nights, that's great. It's, it's easiest. That's our to keep our calendar the way it is. Beautiful. <laughs> so heavy lifting in May. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Great. I think that's it. So without objection, yes. well, the meeting adjourned. Nine forty-eight. <laughs>